Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a brand new episode of A Plus Hero Report, your weekly stop for your Marvel, DC television, and movie news streaming for you guys live today. We got six incredible topics that we're going to be breaking down for you guys to wrap up your weekend. We're going to dive into Captain America 4. That's right. Brave New World wind up giving us a brand new first look this week at CinemaCon. We're going to discuss that with you guys. We even got ourselves a Joker 2 teaser trailer that dropped earlier this week. We're going to go ahead and break that down even further for you guys. Teenage Mutant News. Ninja Turtles is certainly entering the rated R territory as we have a last Ronin announcement for you guys, uh, possibly a Heroes reboot also, and a ton more, guys. So we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> What's going on, fellow A+. This is your boy, Adam Perez, back once again with a brand new episode this week to wrap up your weekend fantastically well, uh, as it's not just myself today, but we also got good old Indy Uchiha here with us today. What's going on, brother? Good to see you, man. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? I'm good, man. I just realized I didn't even have my uh, headphones with me. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I don't have any feedback. Uh, if you guys hear any uh, feedback from Indy, let me know. Definitely got you. Uh, what's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing good, man. Just uh, messing with this new camera. You know what I'm saying? Trying to get the visuals back to what they used to be back in the day. No, I get you. What's that in the background? Is that like a fleece blanket? What is that? That looks awesome. Um, that is the Avengers blanket that my daughters made me for uh, one Father's Day. Okay. Nice. Uh, they, them and their grandmother. So, you know what I'm saying? I just threw that up because it was a little bit too much light coming through the window. <laughs> oh, that's over your window? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It looks good, though, man. I like it back yeah. there, bro. Yeah, appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, but good to see you, man. Um, it's going to be me and Indy today uh, helming our six topics. Uh, we got some honorable mentions at the top of the show for you guys. And then towards the end of the show, uh, some live viewer questions for you guys. Um, so if you want to go ahead and submit your live viewer question over, you certainly can. Uh, just go over to our YouTube page, uh, A Plus Hero Report. Go ahead and uh, click on that community tab, and there is a live your question post for you guys. Uh, you can go ahead and submit your questions over anytime, and we'll get to them towards the end of the show. Um, I was hoping Stuart was going to be able to be here with us today. I know he mentioned last week he wasn't able to attend, but he had a big announcement for us this weekend, but I haven't heard back from him. I reached out to him this week. Have you heard from Stuart at all? I haven't heard from Stuart at all, but I understand why. Congra congratulations, my bro. Congratulations. Oh, I think he just he just hit us up. Oh, can you send me the six digit code that was emailed to you? Oh, you know what? He just, he just, he, it looks like Indy, it looks like Stuart might be trying to join us right now. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. He just messaged us over on the Facebook page. So, um, on the Facebook Messenger, if you want to reach out to him. Yeah, I got it. Oh, we might have a full house for you guys here today, man. Um, look at this, gracing us with his presence. Hope, uh, hopefully you guys are pumped about this. Um, hopefully everybody's week has been going well. I don't know what movies you guys have seen this week. Um, I had the opportunity to see Civil War last night. Uh, or I should was it last night? No, I think it was Friday, Friday night. Have you had the opportunity to see Civil War yet, Indy? Uh, no, I'm actually going Monday uh, before I go to work. So I got the daytime off. So I'm actually going to see Civil War and Godzilla Monday morning. Okay, yeah, I was going to ask if you had seen Godzilla. I hadn't gotten your uh, report card for Godzilla yet, so I was like, I'm surprised you haven't uh, seen it yet. Work, work is hard. Yeah, a lot, man, a lot of know, hours. They got you working a ton of hours, bro. I get it. Um, um, but if you guys want to know my review for Civil War, I did go ahead and drop it on our YouTube channel. Hey, yay! Stuart's here. Hey, you got you guys talk real quick. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna try and get my headphones real quick. Hey, right, no problem. Stewie, what's up, awesome. man? Oh, what is so happy hey, not much. You. How are you doing, Indy? I'm doing great. So happy I, to see you. <laughs> dude, I'm so glad to be on here. Uh missed like the last couple of weeks, so I'm excited to uh get back into awesome topics. And then even though Adam already knows what the announcement is, I'll I'll wait till Adam gets back before I make the awesome announcement to everyone here. Oh uh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. I can I can, I, can, I can. oh I'm so I'm so happy about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how have you been? Uh, I've been good, man. I've been good. Um, checking out a lot of content. Um, solo leveling. Um, I think I'm on like episode four of the Fallout series. Dude, uh, that show is. I'm so excited to review that. I'm gonna have my review up for that. Hopefully by uh, Tuesday. Uh, I'm loving that show so far. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Which took me. Uh, it took me like three watches to get through episode three. Like really? that's the old, that's the only law point I had. I don't know if it was the time of day because I was trying to watch it after work, but yeah, it took me a minute. Okay. 
I, I've been kind of hooked all the way through. I love, um, I don't know, maybe it's because I, I love Fallout 3 and it's so cool seeing like a show that really fits like right into that world to the point where like there's just so much attention of detail, like from the way the, uh, the uh, um, I keep forgetting what they're called, like the Pip Boys, whatever they're called, the little mm-hmm. watches that they all wear. Like the, the interface is exactly the same as the video game and that's freaking amazing. The, uh, um, you know, medication that they use within the show is the exact same that you would use in the video games, like Rataways and things like that yeah why'd our, why'd our uh viewership go up when i left the screen why do <laughs> you got like 12 years <laughs> i'm just kidding maybe it's because i mentioned fallout no nah, still people are just happy to see you man uh it's good to have you back bro i heard something about a, a fallout review is that right oh yeah yeah to tomorrow i'm gonna work on the review so it should hopefully be up by uh tuesday you watched it all already i did Damn. it's only it's only what eight episodes i think it was that dropped was it yeah and yeah. when you get to like the last three episodes it's kind of hard not to binge them because uh they, they feel le- less like three separate episodes and more like one long episode that was just like cut into three uh segments and the, the run the run time in the last three episodes i think are down too ain't it like it's a shorter run time than the first four no i think it goes up i think the last three episodes are uh, 61 minutes each whereas oh, wow. like all the other ones are like 40 something minutes I did okay. watch the first episode yesterday. I absolutely loved it. I'm actually going to go ahead and rewatch it, I think, because uh, I had to I had to watch it in like halves. But uh, I absolutely love the first episode, man. What's the what's the main actress? Ella Purnell, I think. Uh, I think she's great in that role, man. But uh, my, first, my, first episode my future was ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> like great performances all around. And yeah. uh, especially I think my favorite character has got to be the uh, the uh, ghoul uh, as, as they as he's uh, titled in the show. Uh, I love love like that we get kind of a backstory of him from before like anything happens so he's like the only one of our main characters we follow that that actually knows about the world before the apocalypse yeah i i, I love this introduction in the very beginning of the of the first episode so and then towards the end so i'm, I'm really excited to dive more into it man but i'm glad that you're enjoying it Stuart. um but yeah guys um hopefully this week we'll definitely have ourselves a uh fallout uh series review or season one review for you guys so check out uh wait for check that out um did you have a big announcement for us this week? I did, yeah. Um, I probably should have uh, put the image in. Uh, but, guys, I am getting married. I have <laughs> finally, after eight uh-huh. years of uh, Rary, what I think was a really strong relationship, I have finally uh, pulled the trigger and asked her to marry me. It was great uh, because we were at Disneyland when this happened. It was in oh, front man. of the uh, Millennium Falcon over at Star Wars Land. And th- there were three photographers there. Uh, I wow. went to one of them, told them what I was going to do. And he didn't have to do this, uh, but uh, he had the other because I didn't. He didn't even tell me he was going to do this. He had the other two photographers clearing the area as he was like taking the uh, photos for like the big moment. Uh, hey. So much fun! Such a such a great day. <laughs> that sounds incredible, man. Yeah, I think you you dropped the photo to us um, earlier earlier last week, also. But I, I was I was wondering myself I was like, man, that place looks completely empty. So I think that's pretty cool that he did that for you, man. Just to get just to focus on you two, I think that's pretty badass, Stuart. Oh, yeah. It looks empty. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. He was able to clear it because it was not when we got there. <laughs> when um, do you have a, a date set or what? Oh, no. But the uh, joke I've been doing with my friends is I'm like, well, it took me eight years to propose. So I think that means I have eight years to plan the wedding. Right. That's how it works. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you pulled the trigger, man. I bet she's a happy woman, man. I'm I'm, I'm glad for the both of you, for reals. Oh yes, and uh, hopefully you two will be attending the wedding when it happens. Hey, if I, you know, if I get the invite, I'm coming. Yeah, definitely. if I get the if I get the invite, bro, I'm definitely making a trip yeah. out there for sure. You're both definitely getting the invite. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll make it for sure. A lot, lot of drunk at wedding posts come. Oh, oh no. hell yes. <laughs> oh no, I never seen Indiato at a, a reception, man. So we'll see how this goes down. <laughs> <laughs> should be good times though man i can't i can't wait to celebrate with y'all definitely um well awesome announcement man to go ahead and kick this off um some real quick to the people that are joining us in the live chat i want to give you some shout outs in here enrique perez cinema con 2024 finally reveals the cast members of the upcoming animated movies of the smurfs uh avatar the last airbender is now titled ang the last airbender we'll definitely talk about ang a little bit here as well uh also the reveal of the new official logo for upcoming spongebob movie the search for square pants it'll arrive in theaters uh, december 25th I 
I definitely missed that announcement. Um, and finally, uh, the first reveal look at the films like Mus uh, Mus Mufasa, The Lion King, Inside Out 2, and Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and Transformers 1, and Despicable Me 4. Yeah, I think they revealed like um, a title title treatment for the logo for Transformers 1 uh, that looked pretty badass. So I'm really eager to kind of see more about that. Hopefully we get a actual first look um, to the public here within the next couple months. Um, you know, I really want to go to CinemaCon. Um, they have it in Las Vegas every year. I reached out to somebody that I follow over on uh, Instagram and TikTok. I think his name is Entertainment Today, at Entertainment Today. He was posting some updates from the panels that he went to from CinemaCon. And he was saying that um, I had asked him, I said, did you pay to go or did you get like a press pass? And he said that he paid about $1,300 um, to attend all the panels from all the big production studios. So I guess it's like a whole week's worth uh, of panels and being in attendance at the convention for $1,300. You think that's a pretty good price to get um, that type of insight? Yes. Oh, wait, $1,300? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yes. It was like thirteen fifty or something like that. So um, we'll see. Maybe we can kind of save up um, and check out Las Vegas sometime next year. That's definitely a, that's definitely a convention I want to go to because I think I tried to apply for us this past, but we're still technically kind of small in their eyes. But for thirteen hundred dollars, I think that's a pretty good deal. Also, something uh, awesome that I wanted to bring up about the uh, Avatar movie trilogy uh, that was brought up at a CinemaCon. So obviously it's going to be starring adult Aang. So we get to see more of him like as an adult, which we got flashbacks of in, in Legend of Korra, but never got to fully explore. But the main villain who we know nothing about at this point, other than the fact that he's going to be voiced by Dave Bautista. Yeah, I mean, Dave Bautista, I'm, I think is I think is a moneymaker right now, man. I, I think you should give Dave Bautista in almost anything. But I, I I love his voice and just his performances so far. So, yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. Hell yeah. For that. Um, who else we got in here today? We got good old Blossom joining us today. Sam, what's up, Sam? Good to see you, man. Uh, we got Ram Jam in here going pretty good, man. Good weekend so far. Um, we had a we had a, like a festival out here in, in Fort Worth the other day. I uh, had the opportunity. What's up, Rob? Good to see you, buddy. Appreciate you coming through, man um yeah we had a festival out here this uh this week or yesterday took little man out there has some great food uh they had a, a, a cajun food truck out there had some fried catfish yesterday with some rice and beans and some french fries it was it was absolutely stellar tried out some new pizza they had out there in a brand new pizzeria uh, it was pretty good stuff man i love getting out there um let's see here sam says uh, i remember snake known as cobra commander was in transformers original season three so it's brilliant to see a crossover for gi joe and transformers yeah we're going to talk a little bit about that too we got johnny in the house what's up johnny good to see you as well man um so yeah guys we appreciate you and uh, as always listen if you're in the live chat if you're joining us hit that like button man hit that subscribe button if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet uh repost these videos if you're over watching us over on twitter uh definitely helps the, the algorithm faux show uh frankie what's up frankie he says hello congratulations Stuart. yeah man um Thank ram you. jam congratulations also Thank love you. It. loving the announcement man appreciate you sharing that with us um let's get into our uh first segment of the day and uh kick off this show y'all <laughs> Good old honorable mentions. Um, topics that we felt um, that you guys certainly deserve to know. Didn't quite make our top six topics for the day, but definitely wanted you guys to be informed of. Um, anybody got any honorable mentions besides Stuart's incredible announcement today? Uh, yes. Uh, for anime fans, a fan of this manga, I have been for a long, long time. And just to let you guys know, if you have Crunchyroll, yes, it is finally here. Kaju number eight has officially dropped today on Crunchyroll. And you guys can go and check it out right now. One of the most anticipated uh, new animes of the season, um, other than solo leveling, that you guys can go check out right now. I love it, man. Um, let's see here. What else do we got here this week? You got anything, Stuart, by any chance or no? Uh, nope. Okay. Um, I, I mean, technically, I had something, but then I realized looking through the uh, messages, oh, we're actually going to be talking about that later. Never mind. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, something that dropped late this week, um, Peacemaker um, Season 2 uh, oh. is currently in development. Uh, James Gunn teased this photo. Um, day 1 of Season 2 is what James Gunn said over on Threads. Um, he is going to be... Um, 
He says, uh, Gunn also clarified that Peacemaker Season 2, he would be directing some of the episodes, like in Saturday's shoot, but there are three other great directors joining him for the season. Um, maybe you guys can remind me how many episodes we wind up getting last year. Um, but uh, it looks like he's not going to be doing all the heavy lifting like he was last year since he's he's got a little movie that he's working on. I don't know if you guys have heard about it called um, Superman. So uh, I'm just fascinated the idea that he's really pulling sort of like double duty here. Like I, I'm wondering what's going on on his Superman set right now <laughs> if he's filming Peacemaker. Uh, I would assume maybe some of his uh, action directors maybe putting in some work, um, getting some of the action shots and stunt work in. Who knows? But are you guys pumped to know that Peacemaker 2 is currently in development? hell yeah yeah it's, it's got to be better than j cole's apology oh don't don't do this to me man not today um we go, what's up james good to see you in here man um yeah but i'm super pumped for this man i love this shot how are you how excited are you Stuart, for uh season two Oh, you know how much I love season one. So i'm super hyped i just uh hope that james gunn isn't like overextending himself yeah, I hope not either. Um, but I'm glad that he at least has additional helpers on on, on this. I, if anything, I would just, I, I would hope that he's like doing the first three episodes just so he can get them out of the way and then going back um, to work instead of having to like come back and forth. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. we'll see how we'll see how it turns out. I um, wonder if he has like uh, any of the cast like from Peacemaker on the set of Superman yeah. for a quick cameo, like one way or another. Like maybe they can get like Superman cameos in Peacemaker or same vice versa. That'd be pretty cool because I, I think he did say that this was going to be canon to the DCU yeah. uh, for season two compared to season one. So we'll see how he plays around with that. I think if anything, I'm kind of fascinated to see how he like separates the two seasons to make this canon and the other one not, if that makes sense. If I'm a betting man, I would just assume that everything up to the point where we get the Justice League cameo is canon from season one. That That would be my guess. Yeah, you might be right. You might be right um let me see there was another announcement uh that i had i want to go ahead and pull it up on my facebook page first um because we did have some pretty interesting announcements come out of um oh yeah come out of um CinemaCon. one being the fact that yes the uh, gi joe uh and transformers crossover is in fact set to go ahead and happen they didn't really give us any details in regards to this but they did announce it over at the um uh, says Steven Spielberg is executive producing a new film. No filmmaker attached yet, despite the idea being hatched by filmmaker Steve, uh, Stephen Kaplan in Rise of the Beast. If you guys got the opportunity to see Rise of the Beast, there definitely was a tease in the post credit scene that G.I. Joe uh, is certainly coming, to certainly say the least. Um, but they, in fact, did confirm it at CinemaCon. Uh, no other details besides that. So that is, in fact, sort of their uh, their next step. It was surprising that I hadn't heard about that until like I, I saw it like a couple years after it had already been in theaters. Uh, I was just surprised that somehow there was, yeah, that big G.I. Joe reference at the end and somehow like no one was talking about it. Yeah, it was it was pretty weird. I was kind of expecting it to gain more traction than, than what it did. Um, I mean, they have crossed over in the comics, I believe. Right. I don't I don't believe they've crossed over in animation, though. Right. And. Uh, they they kind of did. Okay, so it's actually someone referenced it here. There was a Transformers episode where they had a character who was very much Cobra. They just didn't directly call him Cobra, but uh, it was voiced by the same guy. And it just uh, what what was it? Uh, oh yeah, I think they just called him Snake, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a uh, kind, kind of a crossover. Yeah, kind of teasing the animated uh, or the original Transformers series. Um, you know, these um this recent batch of Transformers movies I've kind of been on board with. I, I still love Bumblebee more than I did um Rise of the Beast, but I thought Rise of the Beast was still an enjoyable movie. If anything, I think the, the idea of the main character and look, the Rise of the Beast has been out for a while. So if you guys haven't seen it, I'm sorry, but spoilers. But um, you know, I I think the the aspect that felt a little over the top, but almost natural at the same time was um anthony ramos the main character getting like a power ranger suit at the end like the transformer suit that like encompasses him and gives him like those extra and added abilities i kind of i kind of at first i wasn't sure how i felt about it but i kind of dig it now um and the idea of them like it almost helps make a further connection towards something that like gi joe would try and pull off also um so i am kind of curious to see how they make this work considering it's live action 
Yeah, and uh, they, they've had they had something like that in the GI Joe or the uh, Transformers movie, the original animated movie. Because uh, I remember Spike had like kind of a uh, robotic suit that he would wear. Yeah, it I was one. I can't remember if Spike yeah. didn't have anything or not. It looked. Uh, I think like the first suit he was in kind of looked like the suit from um, Aliens, like the little. Yeah. Like, yeah, it looked something like that, and it evolved mm. as it went on. Because then he ended up like like a space type soup and stuff. So uh, we've seen suits like that in GI Joe. So what if like the technology that uh, Marlon Wayans had in the suit that he put on actually came from the Transformers and they like tie all those movies together? That yeah, that would make sense. That would be pretty interesting. Yeah, I I would be interested if they would even tie the the past ones together or not, or maybe use that concept at least um, for a crossover. Because I think Snake Eyes was kind of like that reboot. Um, but if anything, they could probably easily use that um, idea of the Marlon Wayans character in the in the sequels for sure. Um, shout out to uh, Marcelino coming through. He said, "Did you hear Laura? Uh, was it Linda Hamilton says she's uh, done with uh, Terminator? Um, yeah, I have heard that. I don't think she was very fond of the movie either." As she should be. Um, the, the Terminator should be done with Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, let's see here. And we have uh, another honorable mention here for you guys. We got new um, casting announcements in regards to the Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan uh, film. They still haven't really given us details, but they've added two incredible stars here. Uh, we already had Delroy Lindo. Um, earlier this week, they also announced Wunmi Musaku. Musaku? Uh, from her time in uh, the, you probably recognize her from Loki seasons one and two. She's initially, she's officially been cast in this film also, but now this week they also announced Haley Steinfeld uh, winds up joining this uh, supernatural thriller as well. So uh, Ryan Coogler bringing in some uh, heavy hitters for his upcoming film. I, I wish that they would give us some details, man. I feel like um, I'm trying to see if it has, uh, it says little known about the project, but what is known has yet to be confirmed by either Coogler or the studio. Insiders say the feature is set in the Jim Crow era South and possibly involves both vampires and Southern supernatural traditions. Uh, Michael B. Jordan may even be playing dual roles as like a twin brother. Um, so that should be pretty interesting. Um, I'm trying to see if it says anything. It doesn't really say anything about when it's going into production, but it is set to go ahead and release literally next year, March 7th of 2025. So yeah. it's probably going to be going into production pretty soon. Ladies, you know what's better than one Michael B. Jordan? Two <laughs> Michael B. Jordans. Watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, huge selling point, man. Huge selling point. Um, and then last but not least, you know, one of the series that I was kind of looking forward to, you know, we've had a ton of Game of Thrones spinoffs announced. Uh, one idea that um, that was in very much early development was the Jon Snow um, spinoff series, the idea of um, of them possibly developing, developing it. But unfortunately, this week, man, um, Kit Harrington certainly came out on his own and said, um, it's not happening anymore. It's not happening. He says, I hadn't really ever spoke about it because it was in development. I didn't want it to leak out that it was being developed. And I didn't want the thing to happen where people kind of start theorizing, getting either excited about it or hating the idea of it when it may never happen. Because in development, you look at every angle and see whatever it's uh, whatever it's worth. Uh, and currently, it's not. Uh, currently, it's off the table because we all couldn't find the right story to tell that we were all excited about enough. So we decided to lay down the tools with it for the time being. There may be a time in the future where we return to it, but at the moment, it's firmly off the shelf or on the shelf is what he says. Um, so, yeah, man. Not happening anymore, uh, which a little bit of a bummer for me, um, because I think out of all the possible Game of Thrones spinoffs, this is really going to be the only one that focused on sort of like um, a sequel, if you will, to the Game of Thrones um, series that we wind up getting, you know, looking a little bit more into the future while a lot of the um, current spinoffs are looking into the past as prequels. So, um, you know, look, I always love me some good Jon Snow. Um, but apparently they could not land on a good story to tell. So are you guys bummed about this at all? Or are you pretty cool with the idea of not exploring this any further? I'm super uh, bummed. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm beyond bummed. I'm like the, uh, still going to watch House of Dragons season two. But um, yeah, I, this was the one thing that was announced as far as Game of Thrones that I was most excited for. And with not getting him back as Jon Snow and possibly not getting him as Black Knight. I wonder where we're going to get Kit Harrington mm. at all when it comes to, you know what I'm saying, acting. I guess it's like we'll see him on Law and Order 
England or something like that. Like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hope Kit Harrington gets the opportunity to be in something else here rather soon, man. Yeah, he's a great actor. Um, I'm not bummed, though, that the show didn't get picked up, if I'm being honest, just because I feel like they kind of wrapped his story up at the end of Game of Thrones. And I'm not uh, opposed to coming back to it at some point in the future. I just don't think we need to go to it this fast. You know, I think, you know, let let the man age a bit. Let it look like he's actually had some experience guarding the wall before we go back to his story. And I feel Let's, like India is about to disagree with me on this. So I, I'm, I'm looking for what button it is to kick you out of this live. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um yeah no i i mean i get it Stuart. in the sense of like they kind of wrapped up his story a little bit kind of left but i felt like they left it you know the idea of him literally going out to the north there is a part of me that kind of wants to explore just what happens kind of after that but i totally get what you mean there um so we'll see man but look we got a ton of other uh, stuff to come out right we got uh, as sam reminds us house of the dragon season two is going to be here they also are casting for the hedge knight i think uh the hedge was was it the duncan egg series is that um what they just cast for mm -hmm. but i think they just greenlit the hedge knight series even more so i think we got like two other possible spinoffs here that um might actually uh come to fruition all of them which are in fact prequels to game of thrones what so. i do like about that series uh from what my girl my uh, girlfriend tells me or sorry my fiance tells me i gotta say hey. that right now. uh but uh from what she tells me it's a uh, very different in tone compared to game of thrones it's more of like an episodic adventure kind of story uh because it's three separate stories that uh, aren't really connected but they have the same character so i think that'd be kind of a fun like thing to do with a uh game of thrones series because you know everything's always been serialized so it'd be kind of cool mm -hmm. to go to a more episodic uh format for for just a show yeah i totally agree definitely switch it up uh, i have no problem with like different vibes and pacings uh for some of these game of thrones they can't all feel the same mm -hmm. so i'm totally down for that um so last couple comments here uh sam says ultraman rising is coming on netflix will be amazing in the trailers awesome it feels like spider-man into the spider-verse i do want to see a little bit more uh from that's a that's a trailer uh, Marcelino uh, if you want some good G.I. Joe content I recommend reading the Larry Hama comics they're basically what Boom Studios is for Power Rangers uh, so if you guys are looking for some good content and lastly he says the only thing that concerned me over Jon Snow uh, show is because it's not based on any books but would be original look at the um, uh, would be an original look um, look at the Witcher blood origin that was bad originality. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes it could be hit or miss if you don't have any um, content to certainly base it off of. But um, I wouldn't have minded the concept of um, original Jon Snow stories. I mean, you got to take your swing at, at it some some point. Everything can't be adapted. Um, Nathan, what's up, Nathan? Good to see you in here, man. He says, so Michael B. Jordan and Ryan Coogler will put out a vampire movie before Marvel can put out Blade. Interesting. Uh, yeah, man. Nice <laughs> shot. <laughs> at this point, I think at this point, I think I'm gonna finally produce like an actual movie before Marvel produces Blade. <laughs> nice shot. <laughs> yeah, for I'm sure. I'm copying that and posting it on my Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right, y'all. Um, let's uh get into our main topics. Y'all ready to tackle these with me? Always. All right. <laughs> I'm like, good luck, y'all. You guys ready Deuces. to talk, tackle this with me? And it just leaves. <laughs> Deuces, good luck, y'all. All right, <laughs> let's get into this. Um, first off, it's great to have the whole entire gang here with us uh, this week for sure, man. So I appreciate everybody certainly coming through because uh, I think we got some hot topics to definitely talk about here. And no, we're not sponsored by Hot Topic after that comment, but uh, we should be. Um, let's get to some MCU news, baby, because I feel like it's been kind of uh, dead lately. Uh, we do have a Deadpool and Wolverine movie to certainly drop this year this will in fact be the only mcu film that we wind up getting but CinemaCon this year uh this week wind up giving a look to the future if you will as they wind up showcasing some brand new footage for an upcoming film captain america brave new world starring anthony mack is sam wilson now helming uh the uh role of captain america um i thought he did a fantastic job in the falcon and winter soldier series if you haven't checked it out please go ahead and do so currently over on disney plus um uh, but this is definitely going to be a continue. I don't want to necessarily say a continuation from that, but certainly a leaping off point from that as uh, Sam Wilson takes the lead in this upcoming film. Um, Entertainment Weekly had a fantastic article this week talking to Anthony Mackie, also fresh off of the real reveal over at uh, CinemaCon uh, to give us some 
new insight in regards to what we can expect from this particular movie. So I thought it'd be really cool to go ahead and dive into some Captain America 4 news for you guys today uh, and reveal even some of the brand new photos that Entertainment Weekly uh, wind up dropping for us as we get the opportunity here to see Sam Wilson with the brand new shield um, or with his shield, I should say, and a great new photo of him in his brand new costume. Uh, this was the costume that he had originally in the Falcon and Winter Soldier series, um, but it looks like he's gotten a little bit of an upgrade here. Um, haven't really gotten a better shot than this one, uh, but this is our, really our first time getting the opportunity to not only see his suit, but also Harrison Ford uh, on the set um, playing uh, President Ross here um, as uh, him and um, and uh, Sam Wilson's uh, will definitely have a little bit of a confrontation and a little bit of a catching up to do now that Sam Wilson is, in fact, Captain America. Um, I got to say, Stuart, um, as we dive into this uh, article a little bit more, um, have you had the opportunity to read anything about um, some of the footage and stuff that um, they wind up dropping from Captain America for this week? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, so although this will all be brand new. Just from that image, uh, so I do have like my uh, one nitpick, which is that uh, I, I can't tell. Does Harrison Ford have a mustache in that shot? He does and not. He does not. Oh, that's that's really weird. I would have thought like for a character like Ross, they would have at least given him like a fake mustache or something like that. That's that's interesting. Well, you know, uh, it's, you know what's even more interesting? They do they do mention it in the uh, in the footage. Um, so we'll 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 okay. talk about that right now. Let's go ahead and bring up this article. Uh, this actually comes to us from Entertainment Weekly. Um, again, they didn't reveal any of this footage to the public, so it's not like we've had foot, footage to certainly show you guys. But we will go ahead and certainly talk about it here because uh, um, again, Entertainment Weekly does certainly break it down for us a little bit. Uh, it says Anthony Mackie. Uh, enters brave new world in the first look at new at, at the next Captain America. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, tackle this. Um, it says, might Mackey feel the need to gloat a little bit now that he is. Um... Oh, it says in a viral moment captured at the fan convention back in 2021. If you guys recall, the Spider-Man actor Tom Holland joked that his fellow MCU star doesn't have his own Falcon movie. Uh, well, that's about to change with Captain America Brave New World, the new Marvel film headlining um, Mackie Sam Wilson. Do you remember that uh, that shot yes. that uh, Tom Holland was Dude, taking at him? The, the shade that the two of them throw at each other is just incredible. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. And so then it does ask Mackie, might Mackie feel the need to gloat? And he says, no, you know, he did that on a very public stage. So I'm going to hold that till the premiere, says Anthony Mackie. He says, I'm going to make sure that Marvel makes him come to the premiere and then i'm gonna sit next to him and i'm gonna watch him watch the movie <laughs> i love anthony mackie dude i absolutely love him he says he, he's got some time before that happens but until then entertainment weekly can exclusively reveal the first official photos um, it says, um, for those of you who didn't get the opportunity to see Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it says the events of that series began Sam's journey towards picking up Steve's Steve Rogers' vibranium shield and assuming the mantle of the next Captain America. Now Sam is back to lead his own movie. Not only that, he's here to assemble a new team of Avengers, y'all. Um, so really looking forward to that. It says Kevin Feige hit the stage at CinemaCon on Thursday where he welcomed Mackie. Uh, and screen the first footage from the movie. This is what um, they talk about from the movie. It says, in it, Harrison Ford uh, makes his uh, theatrical debut as uh, Thaddeus Ross, Thunderbolt Ross. Um, it says... Um, in uh, Endgame, he served the character served as Secretary of State. Ross is now the newly elected president of the United States, though he's not butting heads so much with the new Captain America. It says revealed in the sneak peek, Ross welcomes Sam to the White House, thanking him for his past heroic actions. Though he admits he isn't too fond of superheroes, he says that he can recognize Sam's goodwill and tasks the military veteran with reforming earth's mightiest heroes but as soon as they realize there's a leak in ross's inner circle um so that's an interesting take he wants him to go away i, I am i this does make me fascinated about the what the relationship is going to be like because this clearly is not steve rogers for sure and there's an element i got to think of um sam's military time that he served that maybe has him give a, a different perspective what do you think uh, I think it might be a mixture of that and a mixture of uh, even though he probably will admit that he's not a fan of superheroes, um, I could see him 
kind of changing his mind to an extent over time or just uh, at the very least being more open to the idea, kind of realizing that he may have been wrong. Like, I, I still think the biggest thing that was so dumb in Civil War was him, like, saying that the superheroes need to be accountable for certain events, especially, like, you know, bringing up the first Avengers movie, right? But when you look at the uh, amount of casualties that are displayed on screen, it's so low. And when you look at the fact that the government was about to nuke the city, you know, oh, yeah. it's like, I think in that particular case, it's easy to say that superheroes were definitely the, uh, the, the right call in that, in that particular area. So I'm curious if something like that will be kind of what changes his mind and makes him more open to the idea of them. <clears throat> And I'm also like wondering uh, too if this if he has like a, a different kind of motivation behind this because we know that he's going to be in the upcoming uh, upcoming Thunderbolts movie as well. So I wonder if like what he's planning here is really just to kind of like set up for his actual plan during Thunderbolts. Mm. Uh, so if he has like you know maybe he's having Anthony Mackie get these superheroes, but once he does, he has a whole different plan with them. I'm thinking it could be something uh. along the lines of that. Uh, you might be right, because uh, I have heard rumblings that Captain America 4 is supposed to lead into Thunderbolts, um, so there definitely could be a huge connection there. Um, but let's go ahead and finish this off. He says, but as soon as they realize there is a leak in Ross's inner circle, um, it does say in the footage, a strange sound, an old-timey song, interrupts Ross's presentation at the White House event, triggering sleeper super soldiers in the room to attack the president including Carl Lumley's Isaiah Bradley uh, returning from Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, Mackie says it made more sense for it to be more of a grounded espionage action movie as opposed to aliens and airplanes coming through portals and ish. Um, even though I've been in so many of them and have seen it all now, the opportunity for Sam to really establish himself as a true action star and Avenger comes with this movie. Um you know, I have heard at the CinemaCon event, they did kind of compare this movie to Winter Soldier. I do think that that's some um, pretty big shoes to fill. I don't necessarily know if they meant by it's as good as the Winter Soldier or if we're going to be getting more back to sort of like the theme uh, and the tone of uh, what Winter Soldier certainly felt like. Um, like he mentions in here, sort of that grounded espionage action. Uh, and I think that's a really perfect fit for something like a Captain America movie. And so for the opportunity for Sam Wilson here, played by Anthony Mackie, to now get sort of that um that um that opportunity to kind of see what he can do in that type of film uh something a little bit more grounded uh i'm really looking forward to that i, I really dig that aspect but i think what really stands out to me Stuart, is the idea one that isaiah bradley is returning and considering the fact that he technically is like the first sort of captain america during that time you know um the idea of a black captain america the fact that he's triggered by as a sleeper super soldier i think is pretty fascinating what are your thoughts on some of this though it means that whatever is behind this, which uh, it, my guess is the Serpent Society. Uh, you think they're still in this movie in some capacity? Yeah, I think them being taken out of the movie uh, was I, I think it was just to mislead audiences. I think they could still be behind everything. Uh, so my assumption is like if it goes this deep, you know, they would have had to have been there like uh, what, what, it was Vietnam that Isaiah Bradley was in. Right. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, so they would have had to been around during the Vietnam era uh, in order to have that sleeper code implanted in him in the uh, to begin with without anyone knowing about it and then years later being able to uh, trigger it. So, uh, yeah, I'm curious how deep it'll uh, end up going. But my my assumption is it would have to be like a ancient society like the Serpent Society or, you know, even though we've seen them many, many times, uh, you know, they, they never die because as soon as you cut off one head, two more will arise. So it might be Hydra again. This could be, uh, you know, we've had Steve Rogers take on Hydra and now we have uh, uh, now we have uh, Sam taking Sam Wilson taking on Hydra. Do you think we have too many sleeper cell aspects to Marvel, though? Like there's a part of me that's like it's kind of feels like a winter soldier again to a certain extent, like activating another sleeper soldier to a, a to a point. Um, I feel like I've seen the concept of sleeper soldiers before again outside of Winter Soldier 2, though, but maybe I'm mistaken. No, I do kind of agree, especially because it kind of seemed like the whole thing was like dealt with in the events of Civil War. So it is kind of weird to go back to that again. Um, that's my only that's my only gripe, I think, out of out of all that. Yeah. Um, it says uh, Brave New World Mackie uh, adds that he feels this is 10 times bigger than the Falcon and Winter Soldier. One of the biggest conversations we had from the beginning was for this not to be 
Falcon and the Winter Soldier Part Two. Uh, for this to be its own movie with its own story, with its own characters. Uh, though Mackie admits it's still somewhat of a two-hander. Um, he says, instead of uh, palling around with Stan's Bucky, Sam is in the thick of things with Danny Ramirez as Joaquin Torres, the character's tech-savvy friend from work, and another iteration of Falcon from the comics. Um, he says, they're evenly yoked. They're both military guys. I was his commander, uh, commanding officer. We have more of a friendship as opposed to the way that I admired Steve or the way um, I didn't like Bucky. So it does um, come hand in hand. And there was a part of me that was kind of hoping that um, Danny Ramirez, who played Joaquin Torres, would um, get the opportunity to be in this film. Because uh, now that there is no more Falcon, um, there's got to be some some Falcon in, in the movies. Um, and so while I'm not familiar with the Joaquin Torres character from the comics, um, it, it, after watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it almost felt like it was going to be a natural fit for him to kind of step into that role. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I would love to see him like wielding like the uh, old costume that he wore in the very first uh, Winter Soldier movie. Oh, that would be pretty cool. Um, I think he, I know he's got in the comics, he's got a different color scheme, I believe. I think it's like green and gold, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I am really curious to kind of see what his costume looks like. But the idea of him tackling and putting on, you know, uh, Wilson, Sam Wilson's first Falcon costume would be pretty dope to kind of see him in that, too. Um, he says, um, that same background is why, uh, Ford's Ross holds Sam in high, higher esteem than Steve. Uh, at the same time, Mackie notes, there is that idea of keeping your guard up and watching your back when it comes to each other. Um, it does say that, um, Ross isn't the only throwback to the Incredible Hulk. Um, not, not counting Shira Haas as Ruth, a member of the U.S. government, but Liv Tyler is back uh, playing Betty, uh, while Tim Blake Nelson reprises Sam Stearns, a.k.a. the leader. Um, so he's going to be back in here also. And the, Mackie says he doesn't believe that Marvel fans need to rewatch The Incredible Hulk to prepare for Brave New World. He says uh, this movie is a clear reset. It's really It really establishes the idea of of what this universe is uh, and what this universe is going to be. I think uh, with these movies, it's getting clear new branding of what Marvel is heading towards the same way that I think um, Captain America, the winter soldier did. Um, so yeah, that winter soldier for me definitely felt like a launching pad for like the next, I don't want to say necessarily the next phase, but you definitely had a bigger understanding as to like Marvel is definitely getting into a new territory here with this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then lastly, it says the title says it all brave new world, a seeming reference to the classic, um, Aldous Huxley novel. Uh, the title implies that there's a new bigger enemy. Now, uh, there's a new frontier that we have to conquer is what Mackie says from uh, the first adventure to end game. The enemy was always good versus evil or good versus bad. Now that we've conquered that, where do we go from here when the bad guys reappear in what farm form are they reappearing? It is a new storyline with new characters, with new beliefs, and it creates new ideas of this new world that we're going into. Um, so there, so there are elements to this of like Falcon, in the winter soldier vibes that i i i think is appropriate too because i think that sort of sets the um the the baseline for the idea that we are in a brand new world right we kind of got the opportunity to see just how much like migration took place uh after the blip and people moving around and whatnot and then when everybody kind of comes back where do those you know uh where do those people go to now that now that all that territory has kind of been, you know, taken up by other people, new forms of government and whatnot. So you can clearly see the MCU world kind of being shaken up here. Uh, and with that comes, like he says, brand new characters, new enemies, new beliefs um, in this brand new world. So I I'm really fascinated by what this is going to turn out to, to be, Stuart. Same. I think they did a really good job at like humanizing the villains in, um, you know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And given that it's uh, some of the same writers that are going to be working on this movie, uh, I really hope they uh, continue that going forward. Because I think that when it comes to the more grounded side of the MCU, especially the spy espionage stuff, um, that is where you should have like the kind of morally complicated villains, the ones where you feel like their heart's in the right place, but they're going about it the wrong way. Whereas like, I feel like when it comes to the more cosmic stuff, that's where it's more fun to have the uh oh we're just evil because we're evil like in guardians 3 you know uh, that's where i feel like okay it's good to have those kind of villains now but here when it's grounded you know we're trying to you know somewhat relate and i'm not saying fully related to the real world but like somewhat related to the real world i think it's better to have the uh gray area-ish kind of villains 
Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, I will say I thought this article was going to highlight them talking about um, General Ross without the mustache, um, but it, it doesn't it doesn't bring it up in here. But they do go on to say that in the footage, um, Sam Wilson does reference Ross's new look to kind of play up the idea that it, he's not played by the same gentleman that played him before, that it's Harrison Ford. And Ross gives the line. Um, yeah, they told me I had to get rid of the beard or lose the election or get rid of the mustache or lose the election. Uh, and so the idea of him, he he sacrificed the mustache in order to become sort of president. Uh, but, it, it, you know, when I look at the two actors side by side, there's a part of me that's like, you know what? Without that mustache, he probably would look a little bit like Harrison Ford. <laughs> so I think I think it actually works. I think it's a pretty cool line. It kind of just goes back to like um, the the whole um, um you know james rhodes situation from iron man 2 you know like how quickly it was addressed um the idea that's a new actor playing it and then kind of moving on it seems like that's going to be the same situation here yeah although i do like that being the explanation of why he looks completely different oh yeah i shaved my mustache yeah <laughs> shave my mustache or uh or lose the election so yeah <laughs> fresh new look but um i'm looking forward to this man i i would be kind of curious as to what Sam's decision, if anything, out of this, I think what really stands out to me is the idea of him having to form a new Avengers team. Um, there is a part of me that wonders if Sam believes there even needs to be in another Avengers team. If he decides to go along with this, does he have kind of people in mind? Like, will we have name drops in here? Uh, or is that where the, the conflict comes? Like you mentioned, right? Like maybe Sam decides, you know, we don't, we don't need a team of Avengers. And maybe that's what ends up maybe Ross trying to form something like the Thunderbolts. Or maybe he has like, maybe he has in mind, players that he really wants for the team but he's giving sam the opportunity to make some suggestions if you will mm -hmm. you know what yeah it could honestly just be one of those things where it's like i want you to assemble a team and i'll give you all these options to people who i want you to choose from and he gives him like a list of really bad candidates and really <laughs> good candidates so he gives him the illusion that he's assembling the, the, the uh, team but really he's just putting together together the people that ross wants yeah, man. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. I, I, I'm, you know, um, I will, I will. There's a part of me that will agree here with um, Marcelino. He says, "I wish that they didn't reveal Isaiah Bradley being a sleeper agent and just have um, to, its movie itself to kind of reveal it." Um, and he says, "Hopefully, test screens are now positive because originally they were hugely negative." Um, and that's one of the reasons why they not only brought in additional writers, but they do have plans to do additional reshoots this summer as well. So, uh, you know, this movie does not come out until next year, so Marvel definitely has plenty of time to go ahead and make any course corrections that they certainly need to. You know, and I think Stuart, you mentioned the idea that the Falcon and Winter Soldier writers were coming back, and yes, they they definitely were coming back. I believe Malcolm Spellman, who was the writer of this series, is coming back to go ahead and write but they do have like two uh two additional writers on top of that that i think that they've brought in to do um rewrites to the season so or to the show or to the movie so i do think you will definitely still get elements of um falcon and the winter soldier um uh, but definitely some some new elements involved also um do you think the idea of them doing reshoots reshoots give them the opportunity to really um change the direction of this film yeah, I think so, uh, especially because, like you said, they have a whole year to do that because, you know, this year we only got one Marvel movie coming out. So, you know, hopefully they're taking advantage of that. I also – I'm usually not super worried when it comes to test screenings because you never know who's watching it, uh, what kind of day they've had, and it's always just random people that they just will, like, pull off, uh, you know, from the street. Hey, you want to watch a movie or something like that? So. I never take them too much to heart unless there's multiple, multiple views, but it sounds like this was just a test screening. And so there's many more that we could, uh, that we could be seeing in the future. I, um, I've only been to one test screening in my life and that was for the Will Smith, um, superhero film. Oh, Hancock. Hancock. Yeah. I had, I gone to one test screening for it. Um, I don't think they announced, they didn't announce what the movie was. I think they had sent me an invitation via email, like, uh, come see this special screening from this uh, studio sort of thing. And they didn't reveal to you what it was going to be. Um, 
And I, I even remember watching it. It, it didn't. Even, it was like pre visuals, so it didn't even have like all the good um, special effects yet. Like they still had some of the polygon, like you know, blocksy sort of characters and things like that. A lot of green screen and whatnot for some of the big action hero moments. But um, you know, you got to see what the raw cut of the movie was like, and then at the end, they sort of give you like this survey. You know, how did you like this movie? What didn't you like about this movie? What would you take out of the film, sort of thing? Uh, what scenes really stood out to you, positively or negatively? And then I guess they take all that information and they they kind of go back uh, to the drawing board or make any corrections that they certainly need to. So um, so yeah, man, it was um pretty pretty interesting to kind of see how something like that plays out. That's awesome. I, I've never been to a test screening, but I went to, um, I guess technically it would be a test screening because they basically just showed us a uh, commercial for the DVD release of Night at the Museum 2. So it wasn't mm. even the uh, trailer. It was the the DVD release. And they asked us, does this uh, commercial make you want to buy the movie on DVD? And I'm just kind of like, sure, whatever gets me out of here <laughs> faster. <laughs> um, let's see here. Sam, he says, um, I would like to see the leader control Ross as Green Hulk fighting Sam. He says, do you think uh, we might see Red Hulk. I'm still under the belief we'll see Red Hulk in here. You know, for me, my thing is, I think you could have gotten anybody to play. I don't want to say anybody to play General Ross, but I think you could have honestly gotten anybody to play General Ross. Um, but the fact that they went out and got Harrison Ford, to me, just lets me know that they probably have even bigger plans for Ross than we know. And to me, that just includes the idea of a Red Hulk, man. Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I there's a part of me that thinks that maybe that's who the villain is when it comes to something like thunderbolts um maybe he does control red hulk uh, maybe the leader maybe that's where the sleeper cell secret sleeper cell stuff comes into play um i don't know I, I just think that there's more to it here than um than harrison ford just hey he's our new thunderbolt ross you know Harrison Ford may be an amazing actor, but he's got a terrible poker face. So when he said he when he tried to act confused about Red Hulk, like saying, I don't know what that is. I'm like, I'm calling your bluff there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping, you know, I don't I don't. I, it's one of those things where I feel like maybe, you know, there's a part of me that doesn't want to that that does not want to say Captain America 4 ends on like a cliffhanger of like the Red Hulk being born sort of thing. And then it, it cuts, you know, maybe that's like a post credit scene that we see to kind of lead into something like Thunderbolts. But there is a part of me that thinks that maybe um, maybe that's who the Thunderbolts are going to have to take down. But um, I could be wrong. Um the thing that I think we'll get, I think we'll get him as Red Hulk, but he won't be like controlling the Red Hulk uh, until the end. And I think that's what's going to set up the uh, Thunderbolts movie. Thunderbolts I movie. think at the very end, we'll get a post credit scene that implies that he has full control over it. Um, and uh, Blossom says, Thunderbolt Ross, isn't he the father of Betty Ross and designed the Hulkbusters? I don't know if he designed the Hulkbusters. Uh, maybe. I have to go back and rewatch uh, Avengers uh, Avengers 2 and see if Tony maybe got some of the designs or something like that for maybe something Ross was working on. I'm not quite sure. But he is, in fact, the father of Betty Ross, yes. Um, so the same Thunderbolt Ross that you see in um, uh, The Incredible Hulk, um, that's, that's who um, Harrison Ford is now playing in uh, Captain America 4. Um, I might go back and watch it. I feel like I've I feel like I've just watched The Incredible Hulk rather recently too, within the past year or so. I I still give the movie some credit. It had some pretty good um like even though like the monsters and everything were CG, it does use a lot of really good uh, set designs, especially like in the beginning with the factory. I still love his yeah. introduction to that movie. I think yeah. that was an incredibly well directed scene. Yeah, I, I was a big fan. I'm still a big fan of that. Uh, Blossom says, sorry, it was sort of going by how I heard of him through the cartoons from 1996. Yeah, that I mean, but it still it still works. It still works. That is, in fact, Betty Ross's father for sure. Um, all right, guys. But yeah, let us know your thoughts. Uh, what do you guys think about some of the first looks that we wind up getting here from Entertainment Weekly? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that when we get to something like either San Diego Comic-Con or um, maybe later in the year, for d23 after they've maybe done some reshoots maybe we get more first looks uh and footage reveal but we'll definitely keep you guys posted for sure but yeah let's know your thoughts in regards to some of these uh first looks that you guys got today so rob what's up sir rob appreciate you coming through let's see what harrison ford brings to the table a top-notch acting you know i think if anything I i'm going to be really fascinated to see how harrison ford and anthony mackie share the screen together 
You know, like I know Anthony Mackie's been on screen with some really great actors like a Robert Downey Jr. and stuff. But like I feel like Harrison Ford is just a whole different level of actor and performance, you know. Um, and so there is a part of me that really wants to see how Anthony Mackie handles himself uh, on the same screen with somebody as powerful as Harrison Ford as, as a performer. Sounds like something a Star Wars fan would say. Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what, did you get the opportunity to hear any of that, Indy? I know you had to go away I, for a little bit. I was, li I was listening to the whole thing on my phone. So, like, I walked away, put the earbuds in, was in y'all conversation. Um, what are your thoughts on um, what we were talked about when it comes to Captain America 4? I'm, I'm comparing it to Winter Soldier um, is some tall shoes to fill because Winter Soldier is possibly top one or two, you know what I'm saying, movies that have been done in the mcu and that's like everybody you know what i'm saying agreeing on that that's not like just me just saying it that's the fandom in general uh saying that um so i think that's putting it up against something that can make it a really a really hard climb um but if they're talking about as far as like how the winter soldier was shot the winter soldier for what it was was a really grounded film mm -hmm. and really went uh really i feel um fed off of the story that they were trying to tell rather than huge action pieces i feel like the action pieces were just in um uh, a company you know what was going on with the story and it was really just uh totally. america's hero having to deal with america not being what he visioned you know what i'm saying it to be and i think you get the reverse from what this movie is going to be because i think it's american's hero uh knowing what america is and trying to see past what he knows it is to see something better and to create something better and i think that's what you're going to be at uh with this movie so him working uh alongside ross which i know he probably knows the history of general ross he was he, <laughs> he was sitting in that room when the covia accords you know what i'm saying there wasn't he sitting in that room with the covia Accords? i believe i believe he i believe and he was it, when they yeah. were introduced right so yeah. so all of their uh interactions have not been positive because remember he ended up on the other side of that and for for like you said in the description for ross to be uh buddy buddy with him like you know what i'm saying you're the reason you know what i'm saying i had to fight iron man you know what i'm saying and all this stuff it, you're basically the reason that everything happened and, and what happened when it when it came to civil war so it i'm looking for that relationship i'm looking for who sent the sleeper cells um that lady with that really long name from uh <laughs> seinfeld i feel it has something to do with it because i don't think it has in like you said the serpent society that's why i'm thinking it ties into that um but it really feels almost like a copy and paste of the winter soldier what it sounds like because same thing happened in winter soldier when hydra you know what i'm saying Ac you yeah. know what i'm saying activating and what was going on so i, I want to see where the comparisons stop and i'm interested in how they do the the african-american versus african-american the original you know what i'm saying captain america for, against this interpretation of captain america one who's super powered one who isn't and see how that whole you know what i'm saying thing comes across so um i mean because isaiah bradley is no spring chicken man you know this is a rather rather old guy um so i, I am kind of curious as to how much of a sleeper cell soldier that he'll certainly be and I, there's a part of me that was wondering like will they, will they go so far as to put isaiah bradley in a costume at some bro, point in this movie, bro, have you seen Master Roshi? <laughs> you watch Dragon Ball. <laughs> I'm just, this I'm just, true. I'm just saying. No, I get you. No, I get you. I mean, it, he definitely has some of the the serum still in him for sure. Yeah, you know. So we're, we're definitely there. Uh, we're up there, Adam. You know, what I'm saying, old man strength is a real thing. It is a real thing, <laughs> especially yeah. when you got the, the you know the serum. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um. But yeah, I, I was just thinking of I was just thinking of Carl Lumley's performance in Falcon and Winter Soldier, and I'm like that dude. But it'll be it'll be interesting to see like how they how they pull that off though for sure. See, the reason I I'm pretty sure they're going to give him a costume is because then it, for that exact reason, it's a lot easier to hide the stunt double. Mm, facts, <laughs> facts, and, and to be honest with you, that's not a small man. He's not he's in really good Carl shape. Lumley, yeah, Carl, Carl Lumley for his age. He's definitely in really good shape for sure. So he's never been a small dude. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see how this uh, how they pull this off, man. But uh, I'm excited for this movie. Uh, I feel like um, the more and more I hear about it, at least my interest certainly goes up more than than what it certainly was. Um, so we'll see if um, the MCU can deliver. You have any uh, final final thoughts on it, Indy? Before we wrap up. Well, my thing is going to be is how his how um, Isaiah Bradley acts, his reaction to if he gets his awarenesses about himself back, mm 
on what happened yeah on how he reacts to the country you know what i'm saying especially with the way he was feeling towards it to start off with so i'm wondering if you're going to get even though he doesn't want to if you're going to get sam defending you know what i'm saying america even though he knows it's possibly not the right thing to do against the people who feel like they were used i mean it's a, di- a bunch of different aspects they can go you know what i'm saying towards this movie where you can have uh captain america looking like a uncle tom type of figure mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying and him having to d- deal with more of that like he did in falcon and the winter soldier what if that speech he made didn't get through to everybody you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, I mean, Falcon and Winter Soldier to me had such a really great and deep storyline um, in regards to that. And so I really would like that to be expanded upon. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why they brought somebody back like Malcolm Spellman, who was the writer for Falcon and Winter Soldier to write uh, this movie originally. And I'm sure it's probably gone through several script rewrites, but I hope uh, I hope his voice continues to be heard uh, when it comes to this film, because I do think that's a great um, concept and idea to really tackle for uh, Captain America 4. Yeah, I think like kind of looking back on it, um, you know, I hope it is like like you said, all expanded on and I hope it's not repeated, you know, because it sounds like they're they're borrowing elements like both from Cap- uh, Falcon, the Winter Soldier and Captain America, Winter Soldier. Um, so I just hope like with those elements, they're just they're bringing them back to expand on them and not to just repeat what worked the first time. I will say though, for for Falcon and a Winter Soldier, I, I totally agree with you when it comes to the the Winter Soldier aspect. Because again, that's that's something that we brought up. Was you know, I kind of feel like this is a rinse and repeat sort of thing that we've kind of seen when it comes to the Winter Soldier. So the whole sleeper cell aspect. So I hope that they evolve on that a little bit more and create something new. But the elements, at least when it comes to Isaiah Bradley and the Sam Wilson character and him being you know the Black Captain America and stuff, you know. One of my issues that I've had when it comes to the MCU is then, you know, if you're going to introduce these characters into the movie, you have to sort of be under the impression that nobody's watched that series before, you know? So if there if there are elements to the Falcon and Winter Soldier that I don't mind seeing repeated and then built upon, it probably would be the Isaiah Bradley stuff, honestly, because, I, you know, not everybody has watched Falcon and Winter Soldier. But I, I get what you mean, though. It's got to be a, a good balance. Yeah. Need a need a recap montage. <laughs> yeah. like, like, like recap montage before the Marvel scroll starts. You know what I'm saying? Going just to put you in place on uh anybody who doesn't remember who Sam is, you can do like a montage from when on you know what I'm saying on your left from like when Captain America first came across him to like his build up and then roll the Marvel scroll. And you know I'm you, coming, in, Captain America. You know who does that really well? The the monsterverse does that. I think the MonsterVerse before, like an opening credits and stuff, as they're introducing the cast and the crew that worked on it, they usually have well, like paper clippings or small interviews or like just recapping like how we got to this particular point. I think that'd be really cool to to utilize for our MCU film. That'd or just get- way to do it, but uh, I, I feel like with how much the Marvel movies now start to are starting to feel like shows and the way it's all connected, I could see like at some point in the future in a Marvel movie, you have them going not going like previously in the MCU <laughs> and then just showing like a montage of clips, <laughs> right? It should all be voiced by AI Stanley. <laughs> oh, god, <laughs> the oh. revolt! No, the revolt, no. <laughs> But um, yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts in regards to Captain America Brave New World first look. Um, When we get more information, we'll definitely go ahead and uh, let you guys know. But uh, let's go ahead and get into our next topic. I mean, we were an hour in the show and that was just our first topic. So (laughs) uh, we definitely had a lot to say about that one. But uh, let's go ahead and get into our next one as we transition from the MCU to the DCU. Uh, As this week was a big one when it comes to Joker 2 or Joker Foley Adu. Um, Last week, they went ahead and revealed to us a brand new uh, poster um, that we wind up getting uh, with the idea of letting us know that We were going to get ourselves a trailer this week Uh, and a trailer we certainly got uh, and one that um, I actually really, really wind up enjoying in the sense of really giving us a first look in regards to what this movie was certainly going to be about. A little bit more insight also in regards to maybe how music was certainly going to be utilized, uh, considering just the emphasis on this movie certainly being a musical, if you will. Um, And uh, first impressions are certainly everything. If you guys missed it, I did go ahead and give you guys my teaser trailer 
review for Joker Fale Adu earlier this week. Um, go ahead and check it out over on our YouTube channel if you haven't had the opportunity to. Um, but I really wanted to pick Stuart and um, Indy's brain here in regards to um, the trailer that we wind up getting. I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to do so, um, but I personally was a really big fan of it, man. Um, I think Todd Phillips might have another billion dollar film on his hand i know that sounds crazy to say after what we wind up getting with the first joker um and a lot of people just thinking to themselves do we really need a sequel do we really need a sequel but todd phillips and uh, joaquin phoenix has always said look um the only reason why we'll do a sequel is if we have another idea clearly they have themselves another idea uh, but did first impressions um rise your guys's level of expectations for this film um Stuart, i'll let you go first man what did you uh what did you think uh, I would say with the trailer overall, I liked it. I wouldn't say it raised my expectations, but it definitely didn't lower it. It definitely gave me, uh, th there was one aspect that, that kind of disappointed me. Um, and I should have seen it coming because we, we look at the first Joker movie and it really wants you to know that even though this is the Joker, it's not like directly going to tie to the DC universe. It's, uh, you know, our own take on this, the, the character. It's not based on like fully on the Joker from the comic books. So I should have seen this coming going into this but i was kind of disappointed to see that what they're doing with harley quinn how it looks like she's not actually a therapist in this she's just another patient who's in the asylum with the joker um kind of disappointed by that aspect about it uh the trailer itself looks really good i do love that we're going more into the joker's head so a lot of what we see is probably not what's actually going to be going on in the movie uh and we see that with some of the over exaggerated set designs that they have one that we got like an image of which i thought looked really cool which is the two of them dancing with like kind of the uh the the cardboard cutout background uh behind them like that looks awesome I think Lady Gaga was an interesting choice for Harley Quinn. I'm excited to see how she does. Uh, and then also, okay, so this is something that people have been talking about since last year with, uh, I, let's see, with Mean Girls and with uh, Wonka. And that's the fact that uh, movies nowadays, if it's a musical, it almost feels like the trailers for these movies are made to hide the fact that they are uh, musicals. Because watching this trailer, even though you had some musical L elements in it, um, if I didn't know this was a musical, I would just assume that I wouldn't have assumed this is a musical. Uh, and I think this is something that like Warner Brothers and uh, I guess Paramount, because they did Mean Girls, has been doing a lot that people have been noticing recently. Um, I, I do love your point about the idea of Harley Quinn not necessarily being the therapist. I think I do think that that certainly stood out to me too. The idea that she was going to be a patient in here. Um, I before I get to your thoughts, Indy, I do want to highlight um this one article this week because I believe Todd Phillips did come out and talked a little bit about the, um, the idea of the musical elements. He says um, the musical elements will make sense once uh, fans see the DC sequel. Um, and his comments um, say, he says, he stated that the sequel's tone doesn't veer too far from the first film, um, explaining Arthur Flex weird and is Arthur Flex is weird and aloof and all these things, but he has music in him. He has grace to him. That informed a lot of the dancing in the first film. It didn't feel like that uh, that big of a step in here. It's different, but I think it will make sense when you see it. Um, so he kind of clarifies uh, a little bit more in regards to people's worries about that. But um, what about you, um, Indy? You've had the opportunity to check out this trailer. What are some of your thoughts about it? Yeah. Pew, 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 pew. That's supposed to be my toilet bowl sound. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like it. I have no interest in it. Um, I do believe that it will be incredibly, incredible acting in this film. But this is one of these films that weren't made for me. Made for me, I think. Um, I'm not like a high art type guy, you know. Like, uh, give me murder, blowing stuff up. Um, superhero smack of superheroes. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that. That's my type of thing. I'm a very simple person, um, and they're singing in this. That that makes me want to run at to the hills. They're singing and dancing. Um, I fast forward through those scenes in Disney movies, so I'm I'm not I'm I'm not the type of person that this is this is there for. I can appreciate the 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 high level of acting, um, especially from Lady Gaga because she's she's a killer. You know what I'm saying? Like singing, dancing, act, uh, being an actress, like she's 110% worth everything that that 
that you get for her when you cast her or something. But I have no interest in this. There's no Batman. There's no Robin. There, there's there's this this is this this is an Elf, Elseworlds story that I would not pick up at the comic book stores. Um, there, there's not even I'm, there's no there's no there's no me without you. You know what I'm saying? There's no Joker without Batman. I, I do I do not understand this uh this concept that society made him who he is because I don't believe that Batman made him who he is. That's that's what we, I can't I can't do it, man. I, I can't even find out anything good to say about this at all, other than it's going to make a lot of money because people are stupid. <laughs> God, um, I, I do want to ask you then. Um, I, what, what did you think of the first um? joker film because i i look at that sort of you know maybe correct me if i'm wrong Stuart. i mean i i kind of look at that like as a high art piece also just from like the 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 work that todd phillips kind of put into it maybe not as high art as maybe like what what this is gonna be because i mean the cinematography and the music from the trailer alone sound sound pretty good but i am kind of curious as to your uh first your impressions of what the first joker movie was like then and has that changed thinking about a joker sequel um i had no issue with the first movie it's not something that I went and watched again. I watched it once. Um, of the movie, the last 10 minutes were probably my favorite part of the movie. Mm -hmm, okay. um, just to lead up to that, how, how that closed out, you know, was excellent to me. Um, I love the build up, but um, that, that it just didn't catch me like other other movies. You know what I'm saying? Caught me. It, it wasn't what I was expected. It was something different. A lot of people liked it. I was OK with it. I didn't think it was like garbage. Yeah, but it wasn't my view of what. I wanted Joker to be, and that's not going to be everybody's Joker. And jo Joker can be anybody. There's different versions of Batman, different versions of Superman. There's different ver there's Elseworlds. There's different versions of characters that we know. This is just my least favorite, and and this comes from a world where we had Jared Leto as Joker. This is my <laughs> least favorite interpretation of Joker that we not had. Wow, oh, wow, yeah, I wasn't expecting that one. Um, if anything, I would be interested to kind of see. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think like how much replay value did the first Joker have? And to be fair, if I think about it, I've probably only seen it maybe twice. You know, it's not something that I could kind of put on because it is a very heavy movie for sure. But I would agree with you. Like the final act um, definitely was rather incredible to see. Do you think you'll at least see this movie once just to see what it's like? I'll see it once just so I can do my scorecard rating. Because... <laughs> I have to give my A plus opinion about the movie. Yeah, totally. But it's it's gonna be a it probably weight down the score. So I don't even know if you want to put my score on there because it might be somewhere where it's just stuck at a D for forever <laughs> until, until everybody sees it. But um I'm definitely gonna watch it because that's what we get paid to do. That's what we do for these amazing fans right here. We give our opinion on what we see, but that's also what I love about this channel is because there's varying degrees of opinions. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to one subject and everybody's allowed to have the opinion that they want to have. That's why I love this community. That's why I became part of this community. So we shall see, but am I going to waste time um, reviewing the film on my brand new camera with my setup that I got? No, <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> What yeah, if what if the movie pisses you off so much that you just got to get a rant out about it? And then would you do a review? It, it might get an Instagram reel, like an Instagram reel of me standing outside of the movie theater. It's not gonna get the full setup. It's not a quick it. reaction from Indy. Yeah, the quick reaction. I I might I might go back and do a review for the Barbie movie just in spite of this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your opinion is definitely valued. I was going to say that definitely shocked me. I definitely was not expecting that opinion from you for sure. But um, that's cool. That's good to know, man. I did I did not know that. Um, but yeah, guys, look, if you've had the opportunity to check out the Joker 2 trailer, definitely go ahead and certainly let me know. Um, yeah, for me, at least first impressions, uh, it, it worked for me at least. But this is also coming from a guy who enjoys his musical, you know, types of musical films like that. That's that's definitely me. Um, Nathan says, I think it's great that it can exist without Batman. The MCU ruined this genre with it all has to be connected. Just my opinion. Um, you know, there's an extent to the MCU stuff that, you know, I think initially I was a big fan of it all connecting. And there's a part of me now. I think I think more so since they've stopped doing the um, lower budget MCU mo uh, television shows that we used to get on like ABC Family or Freeform or even ABC sort of thing. I I enjoy the idea of them being able to create other content separated from the MCU world. And now it is now it does feel more like homework than ever before sort of thing. So, you know, just bringing this back to, to the DCU. 
it is one of the reasons why I at least appreciate these else world concepts, you know, um, that not everything has to feel the same. You know, we have a Batman, the Batman, Matt Reeves, which I absolutely love that world. You know, while this, you know, Indy, this may not necessarily be the Joker that we're used to in the comics. You know, there's a part of me that appreciates the idea of being able to tell some type of a Joker story, even if it isn't necessarily to the T of what we gotten from Batman origins, um, type of stuff so I, I do think there's always when you when you keep things open to else worlds i think that just helps the diversity when it comes to what dc is capable of doing whereas the mcu feels like yeah you can maybe switch up the tones and stuff but at times you might be keeping yourself in the box if that makes sense Stuart, when are they gonna give us what we really want the the only thing we want is a story with the Batman who laughs and that that's that's all we want. Just, get, <laughs> just give us a Dark Knight meta movie. That's gonna be a minute, I think, because uh, I I feel like with how much Marvel has kind of overused the multiverse, I think that before we even get to that, James Gunn is really gonna want to establish like his universe and try to like stay away from multiverse aspects at least for his uh, first chapter. For Gods and Monsters, I don't see us getting a Batman who laughs, but because of how popular that character is and because we're already pretty far forward in Batman's uh, timeline for the DCU since he already has uh, Damian Wayne as a Robin. Um, I would say that, yeah, it is possible chapter two, we could get that. And Adam, I got to ask you a question. Does, does the Marvels work without WandaVision and Miss Marvel? Does this Captain America movie work without Falcon and the Winter Soldier? I, I don't think it's necessarily that it's too much multiversal connection, I think it's the fact that we're so trained to look for every little, you know what I'm saying, Easter egg and every little piece that's connecting it that is becoming non-enjoyable when it when we put in all that work and what we want to happen doesn't happen. I think that's where we're lost in the MCU. We're not letting them tell a story. We're trying to tell them what the story should be. I think for me, like for me watching the Marvels, you know, and having seen the other shows, yeah, maybe the Marvels doesn't work without those other shows that came in. And I'm not saying that there's not a place for those shows. My my biggest gripe has always been when we do get to something like the Marvels and when we do get to something like Captain America 4, you know, you have to be under the assumption that people have not watched those shows. Because I don't think it's fair that you have to tell your or make your audiences feel like, hey, in order to truly understand who Kamala Khan is, you got to go and watch the Miss Marvel series, or hey, if you really want to know who Monica Rambeau is and learn more about her, you got to watch WandaVision sort of thing. I, I don't think that that should be put on the audience. I think that should be put on the writers and the MCU to do a better job of explaining who these characters are and really fortifying them in the movies also if you're going to give us this additional content. So I just think that just allow for dual work for the MCU, but work that they they need to be mindful of, I think. Yeah, I, I would say that that's kind of the uh, biggest issue right now, or one of the bigger issues right now with the uh, movies is because, uh, especially like, uh, you know, I think the Marvels is the best example. You can't, I mean, you couldn't watch it. You can watch it, sorry, without watching uh, Miss Marvel or without watching uh, WandaVision, but it would be a lot it, it's just it'd be a lot harder to keep up with the story if you do so and i feel like your enjoyment wouldn't be quite what it would be without watching those so to an extent even though like marvel keeps trying to say you don't have to watch the tv shows you kind of do i think uh okay i'll use this as an example the the fallout tv show on amazon uh, takes place in the world of the games and yet the way the world is established in the show you don't need to watch i don't think you need to play any of the games to truly understand what's going on in this in this show and unfortunately with some of the marvel movies i feel like they're not taking that extra effort to make sure that like if you didn't watch anything that came before that you can get the same enjoyment that someone who did watch it would get um it's hard for me to say for sure though, because I'm also someone who's watched all the shows. So I go in with that opinion, but I always kind of like wonder like, what would someone who hasn't seen the shows think of this? Uh, you know, we, we get that also with Star Wars with the Ahsoka show. There's so many people that couldn't get into Ahsoka because they had no idea like what was going on. The, the, the way things get described in the show is very vague. So if you haven't watched the Clone Wars or Rebels, uh, it can feel very confusing going into it. My daughter got really mad that Grogu wasn't in that show. That's all she cared about. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all she cared about. She went, Grogu's not in here. I'm not watching it. So, and, I, and oh yeah, go ahead. Finish your thought, Andy. 
Uh, but no, I, I told I totally get what you're saying on that. But like, even with the Fallout, like I was enjoying Fallout for like the first three episodes, but I couldn't enjoy anything past the third episode because people kept texting me asking me what was going on. Oh, really? Yeah, to the point where I had to go play the game. Like, <laughs> oh, and it was like, is this father? I was like, no, it's not necessarily finding the story of the game because how Fallout goes is you're creating the story as you go along. There's a basis, but you fill in the little gaps of what's going on and how you play the game. And they're like, I don't like this. And then just stop watching it. So I think a lot of stuff when it comes to the medium, um, us being fans of the content are what let us to be lead us to be able to understand what's going on with these shows because we're kind of trained to catch little things and, and look at certain little things i still don't think a casual watcher like like a mom can't take her kid to go see the marvels who hasn't watched any other content and know what's going on mm -hmm. and I have to have her kid explain it to her or maybe that get, builds them a better bond because they go back and start watching other movies and shows and stuff like that i think that's what marvel and disney are shooting for is you don't have to watch it but if you watch it it's more enjoyable you know what i'm saying or it's going to bring you back to older content because thinking about it that's how we used to do comic books we might have picked something up at the second civil war you know what i'm saying and read that but then we're like well how did we get here and then we go back searching for the older stories to see what led up to that big event so um i'm thinking that's what they're shooting for i just think they keep shooting themselves in the foot because they don't do it very well Mm -hmm. Well, and just to just to wrap this up and bring this back kind of full circle to the Joker, you know, I don't think either um, either way is wrong. I just think it's really about the execution and how mindful you are of the audience that you're presenting your stories to. You know, if you are going to do something like it's an it's a, a it's all connected sort of thing, just be mindful that maybe not everybody has watched all the material leading up to the story that you're kind of being told. And I think when it comes to DCU, at least, I do think it gives them a little bit more freedom in that regards um, of keeping things like uh, Joker as sort of um, as an Elseworlds thing because of the fact that you have really your own sandbox to kind of play with and don't necessarily have to worry about uh, all that lore. And again, for some people that might turn them off because, you know, some people very much are um, enjoy those characters sort of from the comics. And to be fair, you know, not every Elseworlds comic I've picked up and enjoyed uh, with their different interpretations of some of these characters. But I do think it at least allows a little bit more freedom to um, to tell some really compelling stories that maybe going the route of it being all connected doesn't allow for. Um, so I, I, just, I think either either can certainly work for it. Um, Marcelino does say, uh, I saw some people criticizing, romanticizing the relationship between Joker and Harley. It gives off the impression that toxic relationships as healthy and that Harley is a better character post, uh, relationships. Um, I mean, th th their story has been told for decades though, you know, um, you know, that's one of the biggest bonds in comic book history as far as relationships go. I mean, I would hope people would be able to wa watch these movies and realize like, yeah, while they might be romanticizing and in love with each other, I hope people can take away from the idea, but that's not healthy. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> like I, I would hope that we're in the mindset of like being smart enough to realize that's probably not how our relationship should be built upon uh, and walk away from the idea of like, yeah, this is probably something I should probably avoid sort of thing. So I don't think it's romanticizing those type of relationships as you everybody needs to have one of these like no i think as the story unfolds you'll probably realize this is not healthy for either of these characters at the end of the day uh if you like watch batman the animated series and your takeaway is oh what a healthy they, they shouldn't be uh, <laughs> advertising a healthy relationship like this uh my thought is that really says more about you <laughs> than it does about the relationship between joker and harley quinn <laughs> And not not you, Marcelino, but just saying. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, yeah, not, I bet you yeah. as in whoever would be critiquing yeah. the idea of it being romanticized because I have never really seen it like romanticized in a uh, good way. You know what I mean? It's always there. There's they always bring up the fact that it's a terrible relationship in most uh, media's that I've seen. But if there are media's out there that don't do that, cor correct me if I'm wrong, please. And I think Har Harley even goes on to realize that too. I'm sure. I mean. Yeah. But Batman always tries to convey to Harley that the relationship isn't good for her and that she can do better than, you know what I'm saying, than, than Joker. You know, that that's why the, the relationship that she should be romanticized, to be honest with you, is the Poison Ivy Harley Quinn, you know what I'm saying, relationship. Not the Joker Harley Quinn. Like, the Joker Harley Quinn is every uh, drill rapper's relationship that's out right now. <laughs> 
so I, I I don't know if y'all want to romanticize that. You know what I'm saying? Go go right ahead. That's that's uh Blueface and Krishan, whatever their name uh, is. Yeah, that that's that's Joker and Harley Quinn. <laughs> um. But yeah, if anything, you know, now that we're in the DCU for James Gunn, um, I know there's a lot of people pushing for um, Harley and Poison Ivy connection. So maybe we'll get a little bit of a healthy relationship in that regard. I mean, wasn't I, I, I would disagree with that. I mean, the first time Joker meets Harley, uh, he tries to torture her. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, I think I think they were trying to show that that relationship wasn't right. And uh, I think that's one of the things with uh, what was that? That was the Will Smith film, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's like, uh, they even tried to let help use him to draw, you know what I'm saying, that Joker romantic, you know what I'm saying, stuff away. So I I, I don't know. I, I don't know I how think, they can I look think, at that. Yeah, I think sometimes maybe people are using the word wrong. You know, I think the idea of just showing a toxic relationship on screen, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's just reality of the life that we live in. Not every relationship is healthy for everybody. I think, you know, I don't, I can't speak for any of us here on screen, but I'm sure plenty of people have had their own toxic relationships that they shouldn't have been in in the first place sort of thing. So, you know, I think the idea of showcasing those type of relationships, I don't think that's romanticizing them. I think it's just showcasing that, look, these type of relationships happen uh, and hopefully what you take away Away from the ideas that not that you should go out and get you one of these but that you should just stay away from one of them so i think some people just the idea of it being showcased i think people are like it's rom romanticizing and pushing it no i don't i don't think that's the case at all the uh the one uh thing i argument here on the other side is well then why do you have couples cosplaying as joker and harley quinn to which i say i don't know i've uh you know for halloween i've dressed up as jason Voorhees, but you don't see me going to camp crystal lace <laughs> uh, slashing up teenagers you know <laughs> facts but, um, uh, also uh there was a just because uh, i've seen this comment uh three times i wanted to kind of bring this one up uh personally if I had to guess who he would be playing in the Joker 2, my money would be uh, Harvey Bullock, uh, personally. I think a corrupt uh, detective uh, would be kind of a perfect, like, uh, um, perfect way to kind of have, like, uh, a, a uh, I guess, a Batman type character without it actually being Batman. I didn't even know Brandon Gleason was in, uh, in this film. I'm a big fan of his, too. So um, I'm excited to see who he's going to be. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the idea of a uh, Bullock definitely like he looks like he would be able to play a, a Bullock easy for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts. What did you guys take away from Joker to Fale Adu? And if anything, just one last comment, because uh, we have been going long on this topic, too. Um, I think the idea of him very early in this trailer mentioning the idea. I think it's I think it's a, his therapist that mentions the idea of the importance of music and the idea of like how we can use it to heal ourselves and change us and really give us some sort of new perspectives. I kind of appreciate them at least throwing that into the trailer a little bit, because to me, it kind of showcases the idea like that's how music's going to be included in here. Um, the idea of the Joker utilizing it to kind of heal himself, if you will, uh, and maybe attaching some of those those musical pieces to his love for uh, for Harley in here. So the idea of it being sort of like a therapy learning lesson, uh, I think, um, is is a pretty is a pretty fun way and unique way for them to highlight it uh, for this film. So um, we'll see how it goes, though. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, guys, let's know your thoughts on the teaser trailer for Foley. I do. Uh, next up, um, let's get into some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles talk, y'all. Um, because look, I feel like uh, Ninja Turtles has been on quite the roll lately, if you ask me. Um, this franchise is really certainly taking off with some fresh new ideas. Uh, recently, we just wind up having TMNT Mutant Mayhem, certainly a very family-friendly film, to certainly say the least. Um, they actually have themselves a Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series that's going to be a launching point. Um, um, from between this film, Mutant Mayhem, to the upcoming Mutant Mayhem sequel that we're eventually going to be getting. Um, but um, outside of uh, Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon really knocking it out of the park with a lot of their Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles content lately, um, Paramount is going to be taking a bigger swing in regards to uh, expanding this franchise and giving us something a little bit more adult themed uh, as this past week over at CinemaCon, they have officially announced Stuart that we're going to be getting ourselves a rated R teenage mutant Ninja turtles film um, most notably known from the current, or I don't know if it's still currently going on, but from the IDW comic book, the last Ronin, which I got to tell you, man, every 
I feel like every Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan that I've known has been asking for this. I, I wouldn't say this is as loud as like the Batman Beyond stuff, but if you're a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan, I swear I feel like everybody's been like, they need to adapt the last Ronin. They need to give us the last Ronin. And guys and girls, it's coming. Let's go ahead and dive into this, Stuart, because I thought this was fantastic news here. Um, because it, it's one of those things where Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has always been very much a family-friendly franchise. Um, and even in the you know most recent sort of live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, there were certainly elements of being silly and fun that, you know, as a parent, you could probably take your kids out to go see those films also. But to finally dive into something a little bit more adult for the fans, uh, I think is a really great way to expand your franchise and just allow it to be for everyone at this point. Not to say that us adult fans haven't enjoyed Mutant Mayhem in those past films, but to really get down into the nitty gritty and tap into something that not only fans have been wanting, but uh, great storytelling also, I think is really fantastic. So let's go ahead and dive into this. Um, this comes to us from The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, live action rated R Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie in the works from producer Walter Hamada. For those of you who don't remember, Remember, um, maybe Walter Hamada sounds familiar from you guys, but he used to actually be the president over at uh, DC uh, at the time for the DC Extended Universe. Now he's uh, going to be tackling the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. So it says Paramount Pictures is keeping Turtle Power going by putting the new feature project into development. This one, however, will go beyond the realm of the all ages material uh, the longstanding property is known for and instead going into gritty R-rated territory. Paramount is developing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Last Ronin, adapted in a popular storyline seen in the recent IDW comics as a live action feature with the intent of making it for an R rating. Uh, Tyler Burton Smith, who co-wrote the upcoming R rated action movie, Boy Kills World, uh, which if you guys have not seen the trailer for Boys Kill Boy Kills World, do yourself a favor and check it out. My friend Jonathan, who, mind you, is also a big Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan, actually sent me the trailer for Boy Kills World. It stars um, Bill Skarsgård in it, and it looks absolutely insane. Um, but he also wrote the 2019 iteration of the Chucky Horror franchise Child's Play. He's going to be penning the script. Uh, Walter Hamada is producing it. Uh, he is the former head of DC Films at the time. Uh, and he wind up um, overseeing some of their horror division, like the Conjuring and It franchises as well. Uh, and Last Ronin is about as terrifying as a turtle tale can get. Set in a totalitarian future, um, future New York City, the comics miniseries told of how the Turtles and Master Splinter are killed off one by one by the grandson of the villainous Shredder and the synthetic ninjas. One turtle manages to survive barely and vows to exact bloody vengeance. One trick of the book uh, was that it wasn't clear for a while at least which one of the turtles lived as a survivor had the weapons of all four. I really dig that concept. Co-creator um, Kevin Eastman and Tom Waltz wrote the comic based on an older story by Eastman and co-creator Peter Laird. Um, so, yeah, if you guys want to go ahead and check out some of the comics, please go ahead and do so. It says the comic book company recently released the sequel, TMNT, The Last Ronin 2, Re-Evolution. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to go ahead and check it out, I highly recommend it. And I'll let you speak on this first, Stuart. But I think one of the things that I, I love, um, and to be fair, I have not really dove into The Last Ronin comics as much as I certainly should. But one of the aspects that I do love is that the co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Kevin Eastman, and Tom Waltz are involved. Like the fact that this isn't outsiders coming in who are big TMNT fans like, man, we really want to adapt this story for you guys. Like, no, the, the Last Ronin story is from the creators of um, uh, – of, uh, of this story so we're going to be getting um i mean granted they're getting the tyler guy from um, um boy boy kills the world to go ahead and adapt it but the fact that the original story itself is from the creators of um tmnt i'm a big fan of them tackling this story quite frankly and to be to be honest with you the synopsis alone that we just read for what the last ronin is about sounds incredibly appealing to go ahead and kind of bring this to um the the big screen so um i'll let you go ahead and speak first on this um but what are some of your thoughts about this um actually happening 
first of all, I'm disappointed that Indy's not here because I know that he loves this uh, comic he, book series. He might, be, he might come back to talk about it, yeah. I hope so. Because uh, I actually have not read the last Ronin uh, comic series, but I am going to now. This is actually going to be, this is next on my list to check out because I want to read it before the uh, movie adaptation comes out. The fact that they got the two uh, you know, creators of the Ninja Turtles coming in to work on this as well is really amazing. Uh, hopefully it doesn't uh, split their friendship up again like that 1995 uh, TV show did. <laughs> <laughs> True story, actually. Um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, regardless, uh, them coming in to work on this and the fact that it's live action, the one thing I'm worried about, man, I really, really hope that it's an actual suit that they have for the Ninja Turtles costume, like something in line with the original uh, 1990 Ninja Turtles movie, because uh, I absolutely love the costumes that they use in that. Uh, I really hope they don't go with CG. It won't be a deal breaker. Let me put it that way. It won't be a deal breaker if it's CG. I would just prefer if they used a, a, a turtle costume for it. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. And the fact that it's R rated too. So they're not afraid to really go dark with this. Um, yeah, everything about this seems, uh, yeah, it gets me really excited. I feel like uh, this could potentially have that same vibe as the original uh, Ninja Turtle comic books that the two creators did, where, you know, a lot of people think, you know, when it comes to old school Ninja Turtles, they'll think, you know, the 1980s cartoon series, which is great and a lot of fun, but that wasn't the original, original Turtles. The original Turtles were, you know, a satire of like kind of just dark comic books uh, uh, together, but it being a satire it being a satire it still took itself seriously so it itself was a really dark and uh, gritty comic book um one that i really enjoyed reading anyways back in the day um yeah i actually was a really big fan of um uh, really big fan of the idea of this being a gritty rated r film i if anything i would agree with you i definitely want to see a practical suit here you know clearly with some upgrades from what we wind up getting in the original turtles which the original turtles film too is is pretty dark uh and gritty in its own in its own right at least in the way that it certainly was filmed um and so if i can get me a, a great suit actor with a great um physical you know actual practical suit i'll be completely on board with this even more you know i didn't really care for the um cgi turtles recently in the last film so i think that's one of the reasons why i would like them to go this trajectory uh, especially if you're going to go with the a rated r sort of thing i'm kind of down for this and uh, you know I, I don't want us to spoil as to maybe who the actual turtle is that survives it sounds like the article mentions that they've eventually revealed who it was um but i really dig the concept and the idea of us not knowing <laughs> who who actually survives uh in this melee and the the killing off of these turtles but uh i do want to go to to, to indy here i don't know if you've had the opportunity to, to um read the series and if so um if you have the opportunity to talk about um what you thought what you think about this story um i honestly think it's an amazing story it's something that i feel i don't think the casual turtles fan the, the fans that that would actually go see the movie you know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's not geared towards money. So it's not geared towards selling toys to kids. That's the only thing that I'm worried about when I feel like it's not going to get the uh, anything that goes on with that. Um, I really think that what's going to happen is, is that it's going to be an R-rated film that gets good acclaim, but then it's not going to be about anything. Like a, like a Joker? Like a Joker. I mean, hey, you know, that movie did go on to make a billion dollars at the box office. Um, so, you know, they might be on to something here if they can really kind of spark it. And I think if anything, while you right, it may not necessarily be family friendly, but I do feel like a lot of people would be open to the idea of seeing a different take on the, the turtles after such a long period of time. Um, when everything has been so friendly, family friendly, maybe the idea of them introducing us is like a about time sort of moment. And you do wind up driving people out to the theaters, despite um, not necessarily being toy friendly, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you look at um, 
how the last couple times they tried doing a turtles movie you know they went pg-13 they were trying to appease to both kids and uh, adults you know who grew up with ninja turtles and to me it kind of feels like the movie failed to reach both it tried so hard to get both but because yeah it, because it like i don't know it spread itself too thin i guess you could say so i think this is a much smarter direction of having two separate franchises one that's like animated and aimed towards that younger audience uh to introduce them to the world of the turtles and then you've got this which is for the fans that have grown up with the turtles and now want to see the turtles grow up with them with the more like darker take in that world yeah i appreciate that point of view of um seeing the turtles having grown up a little bit more but i do i think the fact that yeah now that you have something that is a little bit more adult but you can still run with your seth rogan sort of animated content and stuff i think is a really great balance of being able to have um content for for everyone uh, Sam says it feels like a uh, Batman ninja. Yeah, that was a great, that was a great animated film. Um, but I'm looking forward to this. Um, Andy, do you know who the turtle is? Yeah, of course. Okay. 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 Don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Um, because I really want to find, I might have to. Oh, you don't know. Okay. You did. You didn't, I, I don't know. You didn't know. read it. No, I haven't read it. No. Uh, 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 Oh, wow. I, I was actually thinking about, I was actually thinking about downloading the digital, um, comic last night and i i didn't i wind up well um, i winded up watching um fallout instead but I, I was gonna start reading it yesterday I'll be, I'll be totally honest with you um i know what turtle it is and i agree with like a lot of people it should have been a different turtle oh you think so okay interesting i kind of love uh I, I can't say it because I don't want to spoil it uh, I'll have to talk about it with you later I kind of love the turtle that it ended up being I, th I think it needed to be a Okay. It needed to be an older turtle. Okay. Okay. If anything, um, maybe you guys can make like a discussion video on on the last Ronin topic. I uh, gotta first read the comic it. book because my okay. opinion might change after I read it, but I will let you know when I read it. <laughs> but yeah, it's on my it's on my digital download list for sure. So I definitely plan on checking this one out because uh, my friend Jonathan has been bugging me about this damn comic book for years now. So I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to give it a read for sure. Uh, but yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts. Um, are you ready for a rated R Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie? Because I certainly am. Um, and I, I I will add this too, just in regards to the franchise in general. Um, I'm really high on it right now. You know, I think um, you look at things like um, Star Trek, for instance, you know, they've got a bunch of like content that's coming out, um, whether that be animated, something for the kids, something with like, you know, adult humor. But then you also have your live action stuff. Uh, I think that's a really great way to just hit like every demographic. Um, and if Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles can do something like that and continue with this expansion of his franchise, I think it's a really brilliant, brilliant move on their part. And this feels like this is very much like a Paramount thing now, like with Star Trek and now Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like it feels like they're taking sort of very much full advantage of a lot of the big money franchises that they have. That I I think is bringing more excitement to just Paramount Pictures than it than it has in years to that studio. You know what I mean? You left yeah. out you left out Paw Patrol. <laughs> especially with their saw patrol marketing that i it, i knew it wasn't gonna work but i appreciate the effort you know <laughs> have you ever seen any of those paramount pictures like ad uh, ads for like their commercials that they've had i think they played them on like super bowl and things like that where you got like all the different franchises like they had one recently with um patrick stewart as picard and um hey was arnold, hey arnold? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they've been money man i've absolutely loved their ads that, that they're doing big things and paramount yeah. and paramount plus is still the um cheapest of the streaming services you know what i'm saying to actually watch that has a lot of content on it so they still got that working for them as well yeah so maybe this is a really great direction for paramount to be in right now but um so good luck to them and i hope this uh last ronin certainly does well but look if you guys have had the opportunity to read the comics yourself um even if you're just a big tmnt fan what do you guys think let us know your thoughts in the comment section box below uh, and with that, guys, we will uh, move on to our next topic um, as um, man, I can't believe we're on this topic already. But, um, you know, there was once upon a time when I had really high hopes for a television show called Heroes. And then we unfortunately got ourselves a writer strike 
and everything just kind of went down the drain from there. Incredible first season that I think everybody loves to remember. Uh, a first half of a second season that I was really a big fan of. And then after that, um, you know, Save the Cheerleader just took on a whole different moniker for me. It was more like Save the Show, please. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we wind up getting four, four seasons of the show, if I'm not mistaken, as it tried to certainly rebound. Uh, and then over the past, within the past, decade i think we wind up getting ourselves a little bit of a mini series uh as they tried to not necessarily reboot but like a continued um story from it i can't do you remember the title of it um indie off the top of your head um no i just remember the little boy was in it the the little boy that i think they tried to make stuff around in the first part of the series Micah? And, and, yeah the techno and, guy yeah the techno and he film? was yeah he was a big part of the sec i didn't it's heroes reborn was it oh, yes that's yeah. what it was heroes reborn uh well heroes is back in the news guys um uh, because right off of the fantastic um solar total solar eclipse that we had out here in uh texas um apparently they are taking that theme and they're running with it as the creator of heroes is like i'm back uh, as they have officially announced a new hero series in development. Um, so let's go ahead and bring this one up. This one comes to us from Deadline.com. Um, it says, Heroes reboot in the works from the series creator Tim Kring. Um, it says, uh, Tim Kring's Heroes is eyeing a second. Uh, hold on a second. I just lost it here. There we go. Is, hot, is eyeing a second encore with Heroes Eclipsed, a new incarnation of the popular 2006 drama series, Sources Tell Deadline. Appropriately, the project is being pitched to buyers now the week of the solar eclipse. Uh, the original series started off with the solar eclipse in the pilot, which became a recurring element throughout the series, also reflected in its logo. Uh, writer uh, Written by um, Heroes creator Tim Kring, uh, Heroes Eclipse is set years after the events of the original series as, as, the, as new Evos are being awakened and discovering their powers uh, that will change their lives. Featuring familiar villains, um, and new enemies uh, who once again will be attempting to suppress this next step in human evolution. It will be up to this new group of heroes to save the world. Uh, the premise evokes the 2015 limited series Heroes Were Born, which also was set years after the events in the original series and introduced a new group of e Evos as more original people discover that they possess unique abilities. Um... It ran for four seasons after a red hot start with a pop culture defining Save the Cheerleader, Save the World, the first chapter that earned the show an outstanding drama series Emmy nomination. Uh, both the original series and limited series Heroes Were Born, which drew softer ratings, aired on NBC. According to sources, the new Heroes incarnation, which is uh, envisioned as an ongoing series, has been pitched to NBC along with streamers so it could uh, find its home back at nbc or in the sh streaming market um i actually wouldn't mind if it actually went back to uh if it went to streaming to be quite frank with you just to be able to to do certainly a lot more things with this but um indy let me um let me go to you first save the cheerleader save the world are you excited for them to uh tackle this uh this one again no i, <laughs> I am not uh, just because Reborn was so bad. I, I think they lost track of where they wanted to be as far as like the original uh, hero series. You know what I'm saying? went Because when it got to the latter, I think uh, fourth season, especially, they jumped the shark. I had no idea what was going on there. It's like uh, the circus, right? Yeah. When they were trying to make heroes, villains and villains, heroes type thing, just oh, to yeah. try to be like, uh, this is dope. Nah. I mean, the, the best thing we got about the best thing we got from heroes is our new Spock. That's the best thing we got from as far as that show went. I enjoyed it for what it was. I enjoyed what they were trying to do. Uh, to me, they were the the really first big thing that was trying to do something new with superheroes. And um, I welcome that because I don't know if I get what we have today in the Marvel Cin Cinematic Universe if heroes didn't try to do what they did. Um, so I'm cool with that. But nah, it it for everything they led up to even save the truly to save the world type thing for everything they were trying to do i feel like the payoff in the end didn't work the 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 hype was there but when we got to what the big big reveal was we're like come on man and then to just have somebody gain all these powers just to take them away uh uh i felt like yeah 
this this is this is not entertaining to me anymore and what's going on i just feel like they didn't know where they wanted to go with anything and they needed they needed a better writing team in order to finish that up it was like the last two seasons of heroes was like the last three episodes of game of thrones to me (laughs) fair enough fair enough for sure I would like to push back and say that is not he's not the only great thing that we got out of this good old Hayden Penetaire, Um, as Claire, I thought was fantastic. She went on to do some things herself also, uh, maybe not as nowhere near as big as as what Quentin did from uh, as a Siler. Uh, oh, in yeah. Star, in Star Trek. Oh, yeah. But, uh, she, she went to go do that cheerleading movie, right? <laughs> she's also in wait, she's also in a very popular uh series recently, if I'm not mistaken. She popped up in the recent screen movies too. And I think she was like on part of was not Yellowstone, but wasn't she like on part of like this Western or like country ass show? Yeah. I can't remember, but she she went on to do some some pretty decent things. And also the This Is Us star, uh Milo Ventimiglia. I can't I'm probably butchered his name. Uh, that played the 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 main lead uh, in the in the first heroes, which I was a big fan of his also. So I do think the 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 big three leads from heroes actually went on to do pretty good things in their career. Okay, okay. M- Milo did this is us. We, we got Silas and Spock. That was good. The we haven't had a Star Wars movie with him in Star Trek movie with him in it lately. Um, there's nothing after this is us. And you said she was in what Hayden Panettiere was in. She was in the recent Scream movie, movies. I'm mistaken, and then another oh. uh, popular television series. So, so the bad Scream movie. I, <laughs> I mean, man, okay. I'm just saying. Hey, I'm just Scream, saying. Scream I'm five not, was awesome. Or I'm no, not, sorry, Scream six was awesome. <laughs> I'm not arguing that Siler probably had the best career trajectory out of the three yeah. of them. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying let's let's give some credit where credits due. The the main leads actually walked away with some great who, opportunities. Who, who were they scared? about not coming back to the scream series it, it wasn't hating no it wasn't it was, no it wasn't hating it was not hating um but uh what do you think about this um Stuart, uh, the idea of a hero's reboot you you down for it or are you gonna give this a pass i mean i'll give it a pass but i'm i'm not opposed to it i just i never watched heroes uh it's not really on my radar at the moment but uh, i do understand that it has a really big fan base so i'm happy for the heroes fans out there i myself probably won't be uh, checking it out though um, you know, I, for me, I, I'm, I'm not excited for this. Um, and I usually feel like I'm almost excited for everything, but I'm, I'm not really excited for this. I think heroes were born like you indie really, um, lost it for me. Um, I, they, they really are going to have to capture that magic again. If they can, this is definitely going to be like a, a wait and see, uh, for me, you know, uh, it, it don't really matter the amount of like first looks I get or like interviews that I get. If anything, I would have to wait and see what this series actually tends out to be. If anything, I'll probably watch the first couple episodes and see if I'm on board with it. But, um, you know, after Heroes were born, um, yeah, my my heart is still with Heroes season one in the first half of season two. And then after that, it was just it just became really difficult to uh, to kind of watch. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can get some memorable characters in here. Um, you know, I'll I'll give Tim Kring the benefit of the doubt to try and pull something off here. I'll be interested to see who, if anybody picks up this show and this idea. I do think it's a great marketing ploy, though, uh, to release this news right after a solar eclipse that we just had. Um, so if if you want to get people that are still like captured in the magic of like what the solar eclipse provided, I, you know, I don't know if you guys got the opportunity to see, well, I think Stuart with you on the West coast, I don't know if you got to see any of the eclipse at all, if it, even if it was like just a portion. Uh, but here in Texas, I was literally in like the totality of it. And I got to tell you, man, it was the most magical mystic, fucking thing i've ever seen in my life dude like um I, I literally can understand like just the coolness of like the heroes and the idea of like the eclipse and get people get in their their powers because it is just the most gnarly thing that i've that i've ever seen experiencing complete daytime and then within a matter of hours it just being dark outside and you just getting the aura of the sun behind the shadow of the moon i mean it was just the coolest thing visually that i've probably ever seen with my eyes before um and it, so to me the idea of like fresh off of that people that are still hyped from the eclipse then you're gonna announce this idea of a hero's eclipse great timing for it but i just don't know if it's enough to draw me in to be fully compelled to be like yeah i'm all in so um we'll see uh, if, if this actually does ever see the light of day 
I'll give it an opportunity for the first couple of episodes. But until then, uh, I don't think any amount of what they show me or tell me is going to get me hyped for uh, for this season right now. I am super jealous uh, for in California, uh, the the most the uh, moon covered the sun. It was like uh, so this is uh, oh crap. My hand's not showing up. So this is the sun. I think we got like the bottom, like almost the bottom half, but really was like more the bottom third of it covered by the moon. So not quite as uh, not quite as magical as it was for in Texas, I'm sure. <laughs> Like, like I could literally see why people chase these things. Like I can literally understand why people go across the country and across the world just to see sort of like total eclipses. You know, I was watching like after our eclipse ended, you know, they, they literally had like live, live um, news reports like of anchors and stuff at like different locations across the country experiencing it and stuff and they literally would have like family families that were eclipse chasers and seeing how many eclipses they've seen in their lifetime sort of thing it, it's pretty bananas it was just very uh, um i don't want to say i mean i guess to a level kind of a an emotional magical thing like i've never it just it just gives you a different perspective, I think, of like just the um, the world that we're living in uh, and Earth in general, just seeing that that type of stuff. I'd never seen anything like it before, but I was like, wow, like I get I get the hype. I get the hype behind it because it's, it's just really cool to be able to see visually. Mm -hmm. um, but look, guys, if you've had the opportunity to see the eclipse this past Monday, I definitely want to know what you guys thought about it in the comment section box below. Um, did you get the opportunity to see it, Indy, or they had you working your ass off? You didn't get a chance to check it out the eclipse uh yeah. i'm in wisconsin so we didn't see much of it 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 just tended a little bit if i was in indiana we would have got the full effect but yeah i was like i know like, it was over indiana at least yeah but we saw like i saw it get a little bit darker but i i don't mm -hmm. seen a bunch of clips in my life like i didn't care to go outside and get superpowers i didn't want that burden <laughs> i didn't want <laughs> with, with great with great power comes great responsibility and i got kids i don't need no more responsibility <laughs> <laughs> i get you i get you man um <laughs> um some comments real quick um sam heroes first one was brilliant but heroes were born lost the plot and storyline doesn't feel like the original i don't know why heroes is coming back i, I totally get you sam like it had its moment in the sun and it uh, it dropped the ball, unfortunately. Trekkie, what's up, Trekkie? He says, I, I finished Fallout this week. I have been a fan of the franchise since 2008. The series is amazing. And just like the games, this follows new characters, but it is canon to the world of Fallout. Yeah, it's very much like a POV situation, a brand new story, you know, um, not necessarily having to rely on what came before in the other video games. So for me as a viewer who has who been aware of the games, have seen people play the games, know the concept of it, but haven't played it myself, I still feel like this is a really fresh take on it, so I'm I'm excited for it. Um, great for new viewers to get invested into the work and familiar with it, and maybe play the games if they want. Yeah, totally agree. Glad uh, glad to hear your thoughts on the Trekkie. Uh, but yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts on Heroes Reboot in the works in the comment section box below. And with that, um, let's get into our next topic because uh, man, I gotta tell you, the uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender um, continues to just grow and grow and grow. I mean, there's this this franchise has never ceased to amaze me, uh, from an amazing animated series to even um, uh, having a spinoff animated series. Uh, granted, a lot of people want to forget the M Night Shyamalan movie. Um, but the Netflix series uh, has recently um, reinvigorated people. Um, some miss, some like it. Definitely mixed bag, to certainly say the least, uh, when it comes to it. But they're not stopping when it comes to their um, last Airbender franchise. Um, not only do we have two more seasons of the Netflix series coming, but this past week at um, CinemaCon, they gave us a little bit of a first look, or at least the announcement of um, an upcoming new trilogy of animated films from Avatar titled Aang, The Last Airbender. Um, I don't know if this is a, I think this is like a picture they might have revealed a long time ago, but uh, we wind up getting more details this week in regards to the upcoming Aang, The Last Airbender. So guys, let's go ahead and dive into this. I know you guys are certainly hyped to talk about this one. Um, so this comes to us from Entertainment Weekly saying, Aang, The Last Airbender, the first animated movie in an Avatar trilogy will follow Aang as an adult. Um, and also goes on to say some casting announcements have in fact been revealed in here as Eric Nam and Dave Batista are stepping into the world of the four nations. Uh, Paramount announced Thursday at CinemaCon that Nam will voice Aang 
in the first film from the animated uh, Avatar film trilogy, tentatively titled Aang, The Last Airbender. We also have Dave Bautista has been cast in a villain role um, with uh, Dion Quan, Quan, Jessica Matten, and Roman Zaragoza rounding out the cast. Um, I'm surprised they didn't. I don't know if they announced who Dave Bautista was going to play. Maybe you guys can clarify that for me as we go deeper. But it says plot details remain hidden somewhere in the Fire Nation. But Lauren Montgomery, who worked as a storyboard artist on Avatar The Last Airbender and the sequel series The Legend of Korra, will direct the animated feature, which is set to hit theaters in October 10th of 2025. News from the first film, uh, first animated film came back in 2021 uh, when Nickelodeon announced the launch of Avatar Studios, which plans to expand the Avatar universe with original creators. Um, so at least the original creators are attached. They have not jumped ship like they have like they did on the Netflix series. So it feels very much like we're in good hands. Um, who are also tapped as co-chief creative officers. The studio confirmed plans for two more films the following year, and they are on board to executive produce the trilogy as a whole, which will be told as separate stories as opposed to a unified three-parter. Um, and I believe that's all the details that we have for now. So my two big uh, Avatar fans here, um, I would definitely want to go ahead and let you guys speak on this. Um, Stuart, if you want to give your thoughts on the brand new news, a trilogy of films, Angin as an adult, Dave Bautista as the voice cast, uh, and three films that are going to have their three separate stories, not a unifier, but the original writers and creators attached as co-producers. Um, what are your thoughts, man? Ah, uh, hype, hype, and hype. The fact that the original creators are, of course, involved. Uh, this is something I've been looking forward to for a while because ever since uh, Paramount P uh, Plus was launched, they did say that they really, one of their big priorities was that they wanted to expand on the world of Avatar which is uh, why you have the two creators like now having their like own studio to work on upcoming Avatar content. So an Aang trilogy gets me really excited to finally get to see like a more mature Aang as an adult. Um, you know, we were starting to kind of build up to that in, in some of the comic books. I would only read two of the uh, uh, Avatar graphic novels, so I don't know how much further they go from there. But I do love with Aang being the Avatar and now having this war finally end, uh, how the comic books explore like a, a post-world, uh, sorry, post-war uh, world and uh, trying to basically have everyone uh, learn how to adjust and get along. And then, you know, of course, the biggest challenge, forgiveness, which is, of course, really hard. Um so those themes are really well done in the comic books. And uh, given that we're going to be like a few years after that, I wouldn't doubt if some of those uh, elements are still in the upcoming movie. Uh, the fact that they got Dave Bautista as the villain really gets me uh, hyped. Um, I don't recognize Eric uh, Nam from anything. So uh, I'm curious to see how he does as uh, Aang. But uh, of course, you know, um, we don't know which villain Dave Bautista is playing. Uh, my guess is it'll probably be an original character. Um, so I'm very curious. The best thing about Avatar villains is that they usually uh, have a lot of layers to them. They're usually not evil for the uh, sake of being evil. So I really hope we get that from Dave Bautista's character, whatever he brings to the table. And, you know, even though this is uh, an Aang trilogy, as they put it, I really hope it's not just Aang and that we get to see all the other uh, characters returning and, uh, you know, being able to catch up with what they've been up to in the past uh, several years. Uh, hopefully Sokka is still super goofy. Hopefully, uh, you know, Katara is, uh, you know, a great... Um, what what was she doing in Legend of Korra? Like, she was kind of with the Water Tribe, I want to say, the Southern Water Tribe. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope, I hope she isn't just uh, limited to being the wife of the Avatar. I hope they actually give her something beyond that. And, of course, Toph uh, teaching uh, people how to metal bend. I hope that gets expanded on. And then, of course, you know, finally Zuko. We have him as the Fire Lord now. Uh, you know, we've seen that uh, just simply trying to be a good leader for uh, a nation that was originally so corrupt and trying to teach it, you know, a different way of life. Like, we, we see him struggle with that. And... Uh, um, likely because of the years that have gone by, he may not have Iroh to help him anymore. So you may have a Zuko who's like, you know, struggling even more than ever. I think there's just so much that they can explore with this movie. Uh, and I'm all for it. I'm, I'm, it, you know, the movie may explore none of that and I'll still probably enjoy that. Uh, I'm just saying the possibilities are endless. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I do think the possibilities are certainly endless in regards to like some of the stories that they can definitely tackle. Um, Indy, what do you think about this, man? And do you want to rebound off anything else Stuart said in here? But uh, let me know your thoughts on this. Uh, I'm definitely 100% for this, especially if you have the creators attached, um, different than the M. Night Shyamalan uh, movie. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm for it. I like the three original stories. I'm hoping that at least one of them tie into or we can get like uh, maybe a a, a hint at something going into Korra because uh regardless of what people say legend of Korra is a really good you know what I'm saying element to the story as far as forward in it you know what I'm saying ahead um I need original characters to come back and it, it, they ain't got to be in like he ain't got to team up with everybody having every movie or something like that but just hints at what's going on maybe the hints of him getting ready to become a father like I like I'm all for this if it, if it's done 100 percent right and I, I want to see what happens. If not, you can put it in the same bucket as Dragon Ball Evolution and just leave it alone. Um, does the does the uh, is there confidence knowing that the creators are attached to this? Very oh, much, yeah. very much so. Having the creators attached to it is the most meaningful thing you could possibly have. The creators were kind of attached to the Netflix ad adaptation, so it made it somewhat good, but it was still really bad. Um, not as bad as what some people think it was watchable but for those fans looking for a, a note for note retelling of the story in live action we got to get over that as human beings in general like live actions do not to be not have to be a note for note story of what we watched before whether it's a, a manga or you know what i'm saying an anime because elements of the story that they didn't put before might be getting put in now i, I would rather just have it be the vision of the creator rather than just something that is a note for note you know what i'm saying cop carbon copy of of what we got before so i'm for it and i'm hoping day patista plays like either like an old avatar that was brought back from death mm. or, or or somebody who was skipped over you know what i'm saying as the avatar from a forgotten tribe or something like that like like can we get a new element in this mug, we get like the heart tribe or something like that. Like, make a, we make a, <laughs> like a Captain Planet tribe. I'm gonna say, can we make a full Captain Planet thing. You know what I'm that all we're missing is heart. <laughs> I would like to also bring up your guys' report cards for Avatar The Last Airbender here. Um, I believe, Stuart, you gave it a D, you weren't too fond of it. Uh, and Indy, you also had a D. Different uh, grading for like acting and editing and whatnot, but they still average out to about about a D. Um, but this is also coming from two big Avatar fans who have uh, watched the the series um, and whatnot. You guys were not a big fans of the series itself, though, huh? Mm. I, I mean, the the Anna, the V, the ver, the the VFX, the vir, virtual reality um, anim, um <laughs> uh, the special effects. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I just tried to figure out what that uh, acronym was when I knew exactly what it was. The visual effects were actually um, super dope. Um, the fire bending was like on par, like that. That that was dope. But uh, it's too much of the story. I feel like they ran through. They they missed a lot of the elements of the uh, character arcs, and that's the one thing that was really good about Avatar. Avatar and One Piece, and One Piece is the hardest thing in the world to watch, but it's so much great character building in the series, and that's what Avatar was. Avatar wasn't just about Aang; it was about the journey that everybody else was on to to become the best versions of themselves. You know what I'm saying? I would almost say that uh, it was about Zuko. You know what I'm saying? Becoming who he's supposed to be, and Aang might have been a side character. It was just coming through Aang's eyes of what was going on you know what i'm saying type deal so uh they just gotta do better than that and if if they're talking about going into season two making tough not blind yeah i'm not even gonna watch season two well season wait, two wait season, it has, is that something well, that i haven't I, said i personally that, haven't seen i haven't, I haven't um heard that, but. they're they're supposed to be changing Toth in order to make her not so degrading about uh, her condition but I'm like that was the best parts about it the fact that she knew what her handicap was and she you know what I'm saying she totally just made it seem like she didn't have that type of handicap she's able to make fun of herself while being a badass Toph is like probably number two in strength you know what I'm saying in ability yeah. behind Aang so for them to say something like that because they're worried about people's feelings getting hurt, I feel like she's a character that would honestly make people feel more better about their affliction rather than worse.
Yeah, I was. It was the you know handicap. It's like hard to say that with her because it it was if anything an advantage for her because like her blindness helped her like feel the earth so she could like see things that no one else could. The only time she was at a disadvantage is if she wasn't like particularly on solid ground. Like if she's in sand, things she her vision's a bit muddy. Uh, but if she's like obviously on Appa, like they're in the air, that's the one time that she's like truly uh, blind. But um. You know, for the most part, again, like she's kind of like one of the best characters in the show, and her blindness didn't help hold her back; it made her stronger. It, so if they that's like taking that, that's yeah. like that's like taking away Matt Murdock's blindness. It, yes, it, exactly. No, uh, she would mop the floor. With no, Matt I'm just Murdock. right, but I'm just saying the fact that like, why would you take that away from the character though? You know, that helps make them. Um, and, and to be fair, one thing that I did hear at least was that the showrunner that did do season one has departed. Um, so we are having new showrunners for seasons two and three going forward for the Netflix series. So, you know, take with that what you what you will. Yeah, back to One Piece. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, that was going to be my next question, as far as, like, adaptions go. Um, Netflix, One Piece or Avatar? One Piece. Mm -hmm. one, one Piece, 110%. They skipped, they skipped a lot of One Piece, but then again... One Piece started as an anime by adapting uh, three to four episodes at a time. And then I think when they got to around like episode 400 or something like that, they started adapting one episode per manga, manga chapter. That's why you have over a thousand episodes of One Piece. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, but uh, let's see. Marcelino says, I think the Netflix uh, needs to expand their episode count to 13 or 15 uh, or more for whatever the story requires because a small episode count is killing them. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that maybe they they choose that based off of whatever series they're they're doing. I hope that's not becoming like a staple. Like every series has to be this number of episodes. I hope they are a little bit more flexible with that. Um, Sam says, I would like to see a Beyblade and Digimon live action film or TV series. Never watched uh, Beyblade, but I love Digimon. Uh, that Digimon was dope. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it couldn't be done. It would just be a challenging series to adapt in live action. Beyblade, go! Yeah, I do. I do know of the no. theme song, though. Baby, let it rip. <laughs> nah, let it rip. Yeah. No, we do not need an adaption of Beyblade at all. <laughs> leave, leave that alone. D Digimon, I could rock with. Digimon would actually probably be a pretty dope adaptation, especially what we're we'll getting so, from too. Transformers and different stuff like that. I could see that be done very well if they take their time to do it. But Beyblade, I don't need. I don't need to see spirits and ghosts coming out of things that are just circling around a dish. I'm cool. I'm cool on that. I'm cool on that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so again, uh, Aang, The Last Airbender, set to go ahead and release October 10th, 2025, the first of an animated trilogy coming out of Avatar Studios, which I think is, I think the idea of just creating Avatar Studios is as brilliant as it gets. Because um, I think you do have a lot of people that grew up with that animated series originally. Now that they are older, uh, the idea of, um, of really expanding that and i think i think Stuart, maybe you said the idea of like you know following up with these characters again now that you're older uh, almost very similar to that of like T tmnt you know now that you're mm -hmm. now that the people that you that watch it are older um really cool to make some some new content from them so we'll see how it goes but yeah guys let us know your thoughts in the comment section box below uh and with that we got one last story uh as we highlight um wait, let me go ahead and pull this up here again uh, yeah, we got one more story we're going to go ahead and dive into before we get into your guys' live viewer questions. And that comes in the form of another horror film. Uh, as we got uh, 28 years later, certainly back in the news, coming off of the very popular 28 Days Later sort of franchise. Uh, we've had 28 Weeks Later also. I don't know if Stuart had the opportunity to check out that one yet. Um, but um, it has been confirmed that we will, in fact, be getting ourselves a 28 Years Later. Not only that, but the, uh, the writers uh, for that particular film have in mind a trilogy or at least uh, a sequel in mind as well uh, as it seems as though they are in fact moving full steam ahead with this um, but when it comes to finding directors it looks like we have some directing news here as uh, they seemingly have found a director for the upcoming sequel already um, they haven't even started filming the first one yet but they are already getting their ducks in a row as to who they would like to see helm the sequel uh, so let's go ahead and dive into this this one comes to us from deadline.com we've got uh candy man director nia da costa 
in talks to helm part two of the new 28 years later trilogy from Sony Pictures. Uh, this is, in fact, an exclusive report for them. Uh, this comes to us, it says, an exclusive. While Danny Boyle is set to return to direct 28 years later, the first film in a new trilogy based on the iconic horror films he helped launch, Sony Pictures is already lining up the Helmer for the second installment. While a deal hasn't closed, sources tell Deadline that Nia DaCosta is in talks to direct with Boyle uh, the original writer Alex Garland um, to produce uh, 28 years later. Um, to, uh, she is, in fact, set to go ahead and possibly direct that. It says, while exact dates are unknown, sources say the plan is for Boyle to direct the first film later this year and the second film shooting immediately after, which is why Sony is moving fast to lock in that second director. This way, the directors can get on the same page about where they see the story going while also bringing their own unique visions for each film. Garland will pen each installment so uh original writer alex garland who mind you just went ahead and just did the um civil war movie for you guys also um he is in fact returning to go ahead and write uh, each installment uh with again danny boyle coming back to direct the first one and possibly nia de costa to go ahead and direct the second one uh, while the plot details uh on this new trilogy are vague the original 28 days later centered on murphy's bicycle courier uh cillian murphy's bicycle courier who woke up from a coma to discover the world had been overrun with zombies following an outbreak of a virus uh, as for DaCosta, the rising star in the director ranks is um, the fit the franchise is seeking, given how impactful her directing style has been, especially with her horror thrillers like Candyman. Uh, up next, uh, DaCosta wrote and directed um, another film, Hita. Uh, previously, she directed and co-wrote The Marvels um along with Candyman, and i think there was another film um oh her debut uh, film little woods which she also wrote and directed which i was actually a big fan of uh little woods also that's really where i know her for uh for and then really enjoyed her work on um uh on um candy man especially so um, I think this is a pretty interesting pickup here. Again, this does mention the idea that she is in talks. So anytime you hear the idea of in talks, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's finalized. It just means that they're certainly still going through the negotiation process. Um, she still has to go ahead and sign on the dotted line at any particular point in time. Things could fall apart and they could easily move on to another director. But it definitely seems as though she is certainly the front runner at this point in time. Um, I, for me... I really, really dig this um, this choice here for directing. I'm also a big fan of them doing this as early as they are. Uh, I do think that it is very important. Uh, and I think when I think of the idea of like directors being disjointed in the stories that they want to tell or having several different writers on board, I immediately just go back to like my Lucasfilm days of uh, the prequel trilogy or the sequel trilogy in the sense of like, man, I just wish everybody was more on point together with um, bringing their story and their vision to life, if you will. Um, and so the idea that this is what they're doing for 28 years later just makes complete sense in the world. This one, you at least have one person writing all three elements in here, but the idea of having enough time for your first director and your second director to mingle, get an idea of like the vision that you want to go ahead and bring forth, uh, I think is is absolutely brilliant uh, in regards to doing this. And I think Nia DaCosta's style will work really well for somebody coming up behind like a Danny Boyle. You know, most people will probably remember Nia DaCosta, not, no, not so much from Candyman, but also from the Marvels and just think of her time in the Marvels. And if, you know, if you were displeased with the Marvels, you know, you probably might put some of that onus on Nia DaCosta. But I, I would say the Marvels felt very much outside of her ballpark, if you will. It felt very much like her uh, doing something new and bigger, sort of on a blockbuster sort of element where I think for Nia DaCosta, she still 
resembles that. I think her best work is very much like those indie film elements. And I think that's one of the things about what really brought Candyman to life a little bit. Um, she she just has this really dark element to her directing. Um, there's a little bit of that even in her debut of Little Woods also. Very character driven, if you will. Um, you know, really long uh, dragging shots on characters and stuff. Very intimate, if you will. Um, and so I think those are elements that really work for something like a Candyman and her first film that I think would immediately, when I think of something like a 28 Days Later, I almost feel like that's right up sort of Danny Boyle's sort of directing style as well. And so, you know, I don't necessarily think of, you know, what we got at the Marvel's gonna be the next 28, you know, years later sequel or anything like that. I think this is Nia DaCosta possibly getting back into into her bag, into what makes her feel extremely comfortable. Uh, and I think if she can bring the characters um, sort of like that anxiety and that intensity and just the way that she uh, directs some of these actors and the situations that they find themselves in. I think Nia DaCosta is a really great choice for uh, an upcoming sequel for 28 years later. So uh, I really love this pick and I hope it's one that, um, that really works out uh, at the end of the day. But, um, you know, Stuart, I do want to tackle your brain here. What do you think about the idea of them getting the director um, so quickly for the upcoming sequel to this trilogy? And uh, uh, are you familiar with any of her work or how do you think she'll she'll bring her style to, to, to this? Not sure how she'll bring uh, because I haven't seen the Candyman, um, uh, the, the Candyman remake, unfortunately. Uh, I did see the Marvels uh, and I imagine that she's not going to bring, be bringing too much from that into uh, 28 years later. Um, but let's see what what, what else was. It? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, as to like uh, whether or not I think it's like too early for them to find a director, it is cool that they're planning ahead to that extent. However, um, hopefully, if they're being smart about it, they're not like signing any contracts quite yet because you know you still got to wait and see how people like the first movie before you even know whether or not you want to make a part two to this and make it a full on trilogy. Uh, so I'd say that's like the only risk they're really taking is really just the financial aspect about it because it would really suck if you sign up as a director and you kind of have to pay a director after they've. Uh, signed up for it whether they make the movie or not so if they're being smart about it hopefully before they do any paperwork um they actually wait till the movie comes out uh so my hype for this uh it's hard to say i want to wait till i see the first movie before i like talk about whether or not i'm going to be hyped for the sequel but it is cool that they're uh, planning ahead yeah, I I am uh, I I approve the idea of them sort of playing ahead like this. I mean, I, I do get what you mean because uh, there are some times when um, series do tend to get a little bit ahead of themselves, and we've definitely have seen that in the past of like having these really big plans to do a trilogy of films. You know, even the MonsterVerse that Paramount I think had planned. You know, they were like, we got Tom Cruise, we're gonna do the Invisible Man, like they were gonna do all this stuff, and it kind of really fell uh, very much flat. And uh, after the Mummy, it just did not work out for them so well i mean maybe they're trying to rebound now because i do hear that there's like a wolfman movie coming out the invisible man was actually relatively good but you know the idea of um putting everything um was it putting all your eggs in one basket uh, a little bit too early i think is the the phrase um sometimes that can certainly come back to bite you but i i do feel like it's a little bit different with 28 years later and i simply say that because you know this is i would say this is a pretty proven franchise for the most part after coming off of two sequels that um, have done better and better each time. Um, you know, I don't know how people really received the second one so much critically, but I know it did well enough at the box office. Um, but um, after seeing the first two films, I really want to see what this world kind of now looks like. And especially, I think for me, what, what fascinates me more than ever is now that Cillian Murphy is, um, uh, an Academy Award winner. I believe he won an Oscars uh, for Oppenheimer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, nominated or win, but I think he might have won. Um, I am kind of curious as to if he is going to come back. You know, he has been very much open about the idea of certainly returning. And I think that would do nothing but just really help elevate the concept of a 28 years later movie. Um, he seems like he's sounded very interested, especially with the returning of Danny Boyle and Alex Garland, the original people that did the first one. Um, and if he could team up with them again, whether or not he's going to be the lead role or whether or not he's going to be like a, a, a secondary role or even just a cameo, I think any involvement of Cillian Murphy here would be absolutely fantastic. 
Um, and I think if anything would at least guarantee that your first movie to some extent might be a little bit of a success to maybe push you towards a second film. Um, but I, for me, I at least like the idea that it's going to be the same writer uh, and these directors at least working together to kind of get an idea of like, let's just make our films at least feel like they're in unison. Uh, and I think that's at least one step to making a successful set of uh, trilogy films. Um, but we'll definitely see here, man. But uh, I'm excited for this one. Uh, yeah. I, I really am. Uh, Tracky says, I'm excited for this new uh, this new series. So am I, man. Uh, I really am. I'm, I'm ready for this um um, you know, 28 days later was such a unique take on zombies in general that I do think it to this day, it's definitely left its impression uh, in that genre. And, um, you know, I, I want to see them kind of build off of that. Uh, Sam seems like he's pretty interested also. So, um, yeah, um, good choice, I think, for uh, Nia DaCosta. I'm, you know, as much as I enjoyed the marvels for what it was i you know i wasn't super thrilled with it but i certainly enjoyed it as a great fun popcorn flick uh i'm ready for her to kind of get back to her roots and um you know i really enjoyed what she did with Candyman, uh and i, I really want to see her get back to her horror element here so um we'll see what this uh, turns out to be but yeah guys let us know your levels of anticipation in the comment section box below and with that i think that will do it for all of our main topics today Awesome. Also, yeah, to answer your question from earlier, he did get uh, he, he both got nominated and won the Oscar for uh, Oppenheimer. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I think Cillian Murphy is really on a high right now. Uh, I think he's got a great name recognition, you know, whether or not that then forces um, 28 day, 28 years later's um, budget to uh, explode a little bit to try and get him <laughs> back on board. But, you know, based considering the fact that they really helped sort of launch Cillian Murphy's career, maybe he'll give him like the Oscar discount, you know, and be like, hey, I know you I, you guys are buddies. You guys help me out here. You know, I'll, I'll do this movie for cheap, um, but we'll see. Yeah, I love, uh, I, you know, and have it be like Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and uh, Jane Simon Bob strike back. Yeah, we didn't want to do this, but, you know, we felt obligated because Kevin <laughs> Smith did kind of help launch our careers. <laughs> so, uh, but, but like joking aside though, I would love to see Cillian Mur Murphy in this because when we first see him in 28 days later, he's just kind of an average dude. Uh, so we see like him, the things he has to do to survive both for him and then the two people that he's like trying to help. Uh, so, you know, if he's still alive 28 years into this apocalypse, he's got to be a completely different person. He can't mm. be the same guy from the first movie. And that's an evolution I would love to see. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of growth in having um, Cillian Murphy's um, character certainly come back. Um, but are you guys ready to get into some live viewer questions with me? Hell yes. Let's go ahead and get into our last, <laughs> our <laughs> last segment of the day. And now, everybody, it is time for live viewer questions, questions, questions. And uh, we're going to get into our live viewer questions here for you guys. Uh, let me go ahead and bring this up here. Again, if you want to go ahead and submit a live viewer question over, you can do so at any time. We probably will drop a live viewer question post on Saturday for you guys. Just go over to our YouTube channel like you see here. Click on that community tab button. And uh, voila, every Saturday, live viewer questions. God damn, we got 12 questions today. Y'all y'all really All coming right. through with these questions. Uh, we'll try and uh, blitz through some of these as quickly as we can maybe not everybody gets a chance to answer them but uh we'll see we'll see uh let's go ahead and scroll down here i think i sorted these out again um wait why don't i only see like oh because one got like six replies on here okay so that's why it's 12 questions okay <laughs> that's why it's 12 comments i was like damn okay so this might this might go along a lot easier than i thought um jessica friedman what's up jessica actually let me get these up these banners up real quick for you so yeah submit that voila okay uh indy's head just popping out there sorry indy no you're good you're good you're I'm, good i'm moving no. around from time no to time. all i gotta see is the hat <laughs> okay uh jessica fryman uh this question is for indy or stewart or both um what do you think uh you want to see in the next season of the live action avatar the last airbender and you uh you think will be better writing marketing and Hold on. And you think we'll be better writing marketing and a connection with Superman. Naomi would have gotten a chance. Oh, would have gotten a chance to shine like Superman and Batwoman. So do you think if with better 
marketing and writing and things like that. So uh, first one, what do you expect to see next season for a live avatar? Uh, what I expect, what I, what I, what what needs to happen is a blind toth. Want to see, yeah. What do you want? To yeah, see? a blind toth and a better uh character development. I mean, they used to spend time with each one of these characters. I mean, I think one of the best episodes was um, it was Suka and Katara. Uh, they went somewhere, you know, what I'm saying on a mission, and him watching her blood bend, you know, what I'm saying for the first time type stuff. Like the character building in the anime was the best part of. Uh, the series and and watching Aang really deal with the pressures of having to be the avatar and how each one of his friends had to, you know what I'm saying, uplift him in various things that he was going through. That's what I expect to see. Is that what I'm going to see? Probably not because the writing doesn't reflect that. So uh, we'll see. I'll give it one more season before I trash it. But if next season isn't good, yeah, you might get your first F on uh, <laughs> on the report card. What do you think, Stuart? Uh, so I it's hard to say what I would expect to see from uh from next uh, season because it sounds like we got a new showrunner altogether. Well, it says um, what do you what do you want oh, to see? What do I want to see though? Yeah, okay. I would really love to see uh for one uh Toph uh and Aang's relationship. I hope they really explore the whole uh reason why they don't get off on the right foot from the very beginning, uh, because of like uh, uh earth bending and air bending being two very different tactics, and Aang really happened to get out of his comfort zone in order to learn how to earth bend. I think that's a really fun dynamic that they can explore. Um, I really hope that they go back to the character development that was great in the animated series that they kind of took away from the live action one um or if, if and again if they want to make changes to the characters that's fine just make sure there's actually something they're replacing it with rather than just taking things away you know uh don't just take an aspect of a character away without replacing it with something new you know what i mean um so that's the main thing and same with the story altogether because i understand they're going to make changes this season too um you can unless they had 20 episodes this season you cannot fit 20 episodes into eight live action episodes without making major changes changes so i do get that i just hope that with these changes in mind they still know how to keep the uh you know overall spirit of avatar kind of feeling uh the, the same um <clears throat> you know and i and you know when it comes to making decisions as to when certain things are going to take place at different times that was definitely one big change that they made in season one that i think mostly worked so i hope you know it's kind of the same thing in season two they really think about why they want to change uh certain story aspects and whether or not it would still make sense in those areas and um do you think with better writing marketing and a connection with superman naomi could have had a chance to shine it's hard to say. I feel like Naomi came out at the worst time because yeah. uh, it came out right when all these shows, when the CW was trying to thin all these shows out. Um, so while I personally didn't watch it and I get that it didn't have the best reviews, I think there would have been an audience for it if it had come out a little bit earlier. Like uh, like if it came out at around the time as uh, The Flash or Legends of Tomorrow, I think it would have uh, had been much better received. Uh, agreed i think uh naomi ended up uh fighting through bad dc content been put out like with movies and stuff like that and the fact that it came at the end because i think what black black lightning was being canceled yeah um it was different stuff like that and i think it was dealing with the fact that it was trying to show us something new uh in an era where things were coming to an end if flash and arrow weren't going to be around i don't think naomi had a chance to survive especially with it not being directly connected to the Arrowverse and what's going on after the Arrowverse ended you notice all the mother shows went too mm. yeah it, it naomi was very much a too much of a slow burn at times um you know marceline does say i think naomi would have been suited better as a side character to an ensemble show and you might you might be right um you know, I think her comic book series was certainly successful, and so I think they took that as the key of like, hey, maybe we should bring her to the bit to the small screen, live action wise. Um, but I just, you know, while there are elements to Naomi that I appreciated, like um, just the character elements, especially her and and her friends, I thought they had some really great sort of chemistry. You know, the other elements, story wise and stuff, great mystery, great mysteries, and I, I kind of enjoyed some of the reveals. But it was just um, it was just really too slow. And the payoff at the end of the day just was not there for me in regards to this long running um, slow burn. And I think I think they I think they've done this 
better for other seasons, but I, I would agree for other shows, but I would agree. I think the the timing of when it came out was really lukewarm. I don't even know if they personally felt super confident with it just based off of some of the terrible CGI and special effects and stuff. It just felt like they knew this probably wasn't even going to get a second season or they didn't want to devote as much money towards it as they have other ones because it was coming towards the tail end of everything. And it really, um, it, it, it really suffered. So, um, so yeah, so I don't know if anything could have saved it, honestly, but yeah, I think I, I would agree that if this had come out, maybe like three or four seasons prior, like at the, you know, maybe like after the, the first season of like black lightning, you know, right off of the, the success of that, th then maybe it might've had a better chance, but I, I wouldn't be opposed to have her having been more of a side character instead of getting her, her own show, quite frankly. Hmm. Uh, Marcelino, uh, what's a who's a character that you personally love that a majority hate? Ooh, hmm. I know a person I hate that I think a majority of people love, and that's Jessica Jones. <laughs> I got, I got, a, I got an answer. Personally, love that majority hate. Who'd you got? The Young Bucks. <laughs> um, I'm trying to still think of like. Oh, that uh, Iron Fist, N Netflix version of Iron Fist. I I lo <laughs> I I loved it. Ninety nine point nine point eight percent of people hated him as Iron Fist. <laughs> I know a lot of people hated the actor because, like, um, I guess when the show came out, they uh, gave him all these uh, – they, they suggested he take all these martial arts class, and he just kind of refused to do it. So I guess that's, like, what people hated about the actor that played Iron Fist. Uh, you know, yeah, I, you know, I did love I did love Hawk Girl, man. I don't know if I loved Hawk Man so much, but I definitely loved Hawk Girl. I uh, I definitely wanted them to get their own spinoff series. I honestly thought that that's what we were either building up to or that they were going to come back for like season two and give us like the Thangarian Th War. But we never we never got it. Um, but I really wanted me some some Hawk Girl, man. Also, Negan is one of my favorite characters because he's one I love to hate. Okay, that that there I I can't hate a character who's meant to be hated. You know what I mean? It's like I love hating some certain characters, and Negan's one of them. <laughs> Negan was Roman Reigns before Roman Reigns was Roman Reigns. <laughs> Acknowledge Negan right now, please. Uh, okay, I got I got a character now, or two characters technically, and it's not because I enjoyed watching them on screen. It's more that I saw so much potential that the writers just didn't see, and that is Victor and Monty from Ninja Steel. <laughs> <laughs> those are two characters i think could have been so great they had a funny dynamic but instead of actually like expanding on that nah then they were like uh what do we do fart joke okay that's so funny man sam sam was a fan of black bolt nice i, I, ho I hope i hope it's comic black bolt yeah i hope it's got yeah for real uh, shout out to tcb records too keep it uh keep keeping on you guys all you are a plus and indy uchia yeah mad love for you so yeah i appreciate that ccb yeah, record yeah y'all better have mad love for me <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yes mostly, yes i love him. cecile i love, I love allegra cecile. i love chester i love chill bane i love cecile more than all of them get it right uh, get it yeah, right yeah, but yeah, but you but you know who i hate marcelino who do you hate <laughs> iris oh yeah <laughs> iris west <laughs> yeah, i've never seen some yeah I don't know if it's an Iris thing or a Candace Patton thing, or maybe a combo of both. It, I think it was a Candace Patton thing. It was the Candace Patton uh, news that came out, you know what I'm saying, a while ago. And I just couldn't take, I couldn't take the actor out of the character. Yeah, I couldn't take the actor yeah. out of the character. I kept seeing Candace Patton <laughs> when I was watching. So I guess, yeah. You. I think that's me uh, with Mark Wahlberg, why I tend to hate most of his characters. It's <laughs> like, I don't think I hate his character. I think I just hate Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marcel also says, you know how a show normally goes downhill when most of the original cast members get replaced? Well, can you name a show where it became better or more beloved because the new replacements were much better than the original cast members? Batwoman. Ah. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, the other one, uh, I I think a lot of fans will kind of agree on this that Power Rangers Turbo pa- actually got better when the cast got replaced halfway through. Power Rangers got better as soon as Adam showed up. Thank you. Oh, you mean Adam <laughs> Park? I guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um let's see uh and he says when it comes to uh anti-woke crowd uh like geek and gamers ryan cannell and nerd ronica they often use their diverse friends to help justify the arm oh like the i got black friends thing comment to mm-hmm. showcase the, the trump not- defense as i like to call it <laughs> <laughs> and to show that they're not sexist racist or homophobic for example whenever shaman obey chinoy says it's time for female filmmakers to direct star wars or that she loves making men feel uncomfortable they bring in their female friends <laughs> like uh that star wars girl and krista nova maloney melanie mack uh and my nerdy home to say that she doesn't speak for women and that women find uh, her comments offensive or sexist um and he gives another example or when amazon cast people of color for the rings of power uh they brought into their multi- multicolored friends such as eric july and some other people to say that it's a betrayal of tokens work and it's a further endorsement of ongoing issues of uh, tokenizing people of color what are your thoughts whenever they do stuff like this they don't that's their opinion their opinion doesn't yeah, matter in my yeah. world and um i'm all for it other than that, I mean, you're allowed to have the opinion you want, but uh, numbers speak for themselves when it comes to the numbers that these programs are doing. And whatever they're doing is working when it comes to, you know what I'm saying, getting shows renewed and getting more shows like this on the air. So, in the end for companies, is about making money. They can care less about who you, who you personally want to see on screen. But um, as long as it's not an issue with the original content's creator and they're okay with it, I have no problem with it. Um, yeah, I'm look. I've never been a. I've never. <laughs> I've never been a fan of the whole like. I've got black friends, so I can't be racist. <laughs> like I just, I just like stuff like that. Or ha- I have female friends that uh, don't agree with her. I mean, that that's cool, man. That's their. That's their own perspective. You know, nobody's saying that Shermaine Obey Chinoy speaks for all women, nor do your friends that feel opposite speak for all women. You know, like there is a balance in between. And I, I just sometimes I just don't understand that because at the end of the day, I think a lot of people, especially male uh, fans of Star Wars, female fans of Star Wars have really enjoyed, say, like Dallas Bryce Howard's work on Star Wars and she's directed Star Wars before. Right. So I think if anything, if there's if there's been anybody, I think female wise that a lot of people have asked for, like, yeah, we kind of want to see her direct a Star Wars film is probably Dallas Bryce Howard. So I do think there's a place for female filmmakers to direct Star Wars. Um, I mean, I'm sorry if other females don't necessarily feel that way, but that's just, you know, that's that's one of their opinions and i'm sure there's another group of female fans that would like to see a female direct star wars so we just can't take like oh well my black friend says so that then that makes it like you know um you know the scripture sort of thing that that, that's the plan that we should certainly follow um in the same way that like when i when there's a white person that says something uh you know really racist or messed up i like to think hey that does not speak for all white people out there so kind of like you know same thing there (laughs) if you this is my thing if you need a person of color to validate your opinion there might be something wrong with your opinion (laughs) yes yes thank you um but like like you just said you think uh a lot of this topic should be talked about a lot more the problem is that this this topic has to be talked about at all um, in order, you know what I'm saying, to bring some type of awareness to it. it. It shouldn't be a topic. It should be something that's just naturally, you know what I'm saying, done. But if if Stuart has something and he's arguing with somebody and he's like, well, my friend Indy, if the, the minute he says my friend Indy is the minute he lost the argument. <laughs> <laughs> so you you shouldn't you should be able to stand on your own opinions and your own morals without having somebody else represent an entire community to back you up in something you know what i'm saying that you're arguing with that, that that's that's what we need to get past the only time i would say there's an exception is if the argument is not every single person under blank category agrees with this and then i would use one person as an example because it, and that's only if, but of course that never comes up in in like debate but if it were to come up in a debate that would be my only time like kind of saying it 
Like, you well, know what I mean? Or if it's Drake because he covers all ethnicities. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, man, I mean, look, I, I, I just, yeah, the whole anti will crowd, I'd rather just not even deal with, honestly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Blossom, uh, what you think of the newest episode of X-Men 97, uh, way different than how we remember oh. them, huh? Darker too. Um, yeah, man. I, I, I come to say that, um, even the, uh, the former X-Men animated series, I don't think that it's darker. I, I think I, I feel like if you go back and you watch the original series, it's in no way darker. It's right on the same path. It's just that this is not something that would have happened episode five. It would have happened at the end of the season. You know what I'm saying before. Now they're going because everything is all shock value and tell the stories. Um, it's going to happen. You know what I'm saying right now. But the thing that I'm going to say about that is, is if this happened this early, that's because there's just something <laughs> even bigger that's going to happen at the end of the season. So they're just setting you up. We're all in mourning right now, but you got to think. We're probably going to get Storm, who gets her powers back. That'll be an uplifting moment. They want to drag as far. It's great storytelling. They're going to drag as far, feeling as bad as possible, in order for when the heroic thing happens to have such a payoff. I keep making wrestling uh, references because I'm doing this for Detilla. Make sure you go check out her and her wrestling reviews and podcasts over on our page. But it's similar to like the Cody Rhodes storyline, right? We had two years of him failing at what he was going to do before he finally succeeded in finishing his story. We'll be getting the same thing from this short span of X Men '97 that we're going to get. Um, and oh, I'm sorry. And I, I do want to say just one thing here too, um, because you know, uh, Bo DeMeo, uh, the writer and creator of X Men '97, um, after he had been fired, we haven't really heard anything from him. But after dropping episode number five, he actually did break some of his silence in regards to like just realizing the impact of what that episode was. I, I, I'm just going to read a portion of it because it's really long. So I'm just going to read the first paragraph and then the last paragraph to kind of sum things up with what he's talking about here. But I would recommend everybody go ahead and certainly check out what he had to say about it. But um, he says a lot of questions. Uh, and so I momentarily break my silence to answer episode five was the centerpiece of my pitch to marvel in november 2020 the idea being to have the x-men mirror the journey that any of us who grew up with the original show have experienced since being kids in the 90s the world was seemingly a safer place for us where a character like storm would comment on how skin-based racism was quaint in one man's worth for the most part, to our young minds, the world was a simple place, right and uh, a, a simple place of right and wrong, where questions about identity and social justice had relatively clear-cut answers. And then he mentions the idea that 9/11 happened and the world turned against itself. Um, he goes on to say at the end, he says, like many of us who grew up. On the OG cartoon, the X-Men have been hit hard by the realities of an adult and an unsafe world. Life's happened to them, and they, like we did, will have to decide which parts of themselves they will cling to and which parts they'll let go of in order to do what they've been telling humanity to do. Face an uncertain future they never saw coming. As Trask told Cyclops in the premiere, you have no idea what it's like to be left behind by the future. Now the X-Men do, and like each of us, they'll have to weigh whether this is a time for social justice or as Magneto preached at his trial, it is time for a social healing. So I thought that was um, pretty impactful. Pretty powerful stuff from uh Bo DeMeo and, and again showing why he's he's a great writer for this series. If if that man is not attached to the Diddy case, <laughs> bring him back. Because if, if he wasn't if he was not fired for a justifiable reason, which we don't know why he was let so, go. Oh yeah, yeah. If if it's not nothing that's justifiable, bring that man back. If it was something where he just went in there and was like, Hey, this is dope, y'all need to give me more money to come back, and he was like, No, nah, we're good, we're not gonna give you more money, we'll just give it to somebody else. Pay that man and bring him back. Period. Yeah, man. I, again, I would recommend uh, checking it out. I, I don't know if this is something he left on Twitter, on Instagram, um, but yeah, go ahead and uh, find uh, Bo DeMeo's comments on episode five for sure. Especially dumb if it turned out the rumors are true of why he got fired, which uh, the the rumors is is because he had an OnlyFans. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, which, I can, which I to can. me that's that's a dumb reason to fire someone, especially because you hired him while he still had the account. So it's like. Yeah, get, get get that out of here. Disney, you own porn companies. <laughs> like <laughs> like like figure figure some way to make that into a multiverse. Send his OnlyFans over there. You know, like I, I, I don't know. Like figure it out. 
Uh, Blossom also said, I know I asked you guys this before about the Giga Tokusatsu ranges, but how'd it be if somewhere uh, com- if somewhere comic books as well as video games, the Waku Sabres, Prism 3, and their newest ones were comic books, um, and Dino Vaders were my Tokugers. Uh, favorite video game um i kind of dig that idea um giga made too many ranger parodies i mean jizo jody yeah they, they really did um but yeah i kind of like that idea it'd be really great sort of like easter eggs and a way of including them but without necessarily giving them like main focus i, I kind of dig that like the, that they exist in your world but in other forms of media i kind of dig that um also i don't know if you did you highlight this uh indy he says one last thing help us congratulate the multi-talented indy uchia on his song reaching for the stars reaching 4.5 wow. million streams bro congratulations I mean, can i move you up in here just to give you some praise congratulations indy 4.5 Th- million streams man damn thank you I, I appreciate that i really appreciate that now go stream more music so we can get all the songs to 4.5 million streams. <laughs> it, it's, it's only going to help this channel. The more successful to us we are as individuals, the more successful we are as a group. Go help us out right now. Uh, we got Johnny with some questions. If MMPR or just Power Rangers gets animated series, could we see it go the route and animation style as X-Men 97? Uh, you know it gave that same 90s style but better because Marvel Studios is doing a great job with it. Uh, I mean, I think it's going to be probably done under a different banner, so I expect a different animation style. Um, but I will say there there are elements to this new X Men ninety seven animation that is not on par with X Men ninety at all. In fact, I feel like they've enhanced it, especially especially during the action sequences. The action sequences just blew me away each and every time I see them week to week. Is it me or does Magneto look like Beast before he turned back human? From, the, the, from, from uh from Disney from like the uh Beauty and the Beast like it's, it's just, oh uh, oh like Gaston yeah, yeah <laughs> or, he, no no not Gaston, not Gaston sorry Gaston, but no, yeah the, yeah he he looked like yeah he, he looked like the Beast before he turned back human like he <laughs> still looks like a Beast like it's women who are up there like oh I'm here for Magneto I'm like I don't know how <laughs> like like I'm looking at him like that is not an attractive man I'm like you you put it's you the put, long locks bro you, it's the long hair you put Gambit, muscles <laughs> maybe maybe it, maybe it's because Gambit had a ponytail and that's what was throwing him off you know what I'm saying but you you put Gambit with those beautiful red eyes next to Magneto and you're like she chose Magneto <laughs> like like they're choosing Magneto over Gambit I'm like even Scott looks better than Gambit right now like come on bro yeah so it's a long old man white hair locks that get him man it's, it's got to be the way he talks which the is also proper which panty is also proper. annoying that, that was one thing i hope they would have changed in this series is the M- magneto's dialogue <laughs> uh shout out to blossom for the five dollar super chat thank you so much for continuing to support the channel blossom really it definitely goes uh noticed animated power rangers holy macaroni manoli i bet i need to make a t-shirt you need to make like some some logo t-shirts uh slogan t-shirts with the with those i, I love those i got uh, you. I, I bet you it would be cool. Um, yeah, I, I you know, look, I do hope that they give us an animated Power Rangers at some point in time. I've always kind of um, I've always really asked for like an anthology sort of series animated. Um, you know, I, if Hasbro, you know, wants to continue to do their reboot and expand the universe and give us like new Power Rangers in animated form, that's cool and all. But I would not mind Hasbro holding on to the past a little bit in regards to animation um, and really diving between, you know, all the different series of Power Rangers that we've had and just told telling singular stories for each team throughout like a 10 to 13 episode series. Um, I, I would really love something along those lines. But but as far as like what well, the animated series could they go the same route in animation style? I don't think it needs to be the same animation style as X-Men 97, but just something unique I'd be down for. If anything, I kind of want to see an anime style uh, with the uh, Power Rangers animated series. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love that. And I think Blossom is giving, a, giving us enough super chats for her to get a t-shirt. So <laughs> Probably, bro. She, she definitely needs to contact Adam with her uh, P.O. box or her mailing address so we could send her some t-shirts. Yeah, maybe we'll give her like her own special one that will have the the slogan "Holy Macaroni uh, Manoli" I'm, on it. I'm already in the process. I already sent it to the graphic artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I appreciate that, uh, Blossom, for always coming through. Jesus, uh, hold up! She hit you with another one. Another one, damn. Um, oops, sorry, I brought it down. This just came to me. Uh, the parody Sentai Legend Mirror. 
How about them being rangers that get access to the morphing grid via a magic mirror? There's a parody of there, like the Sentai Legend mirror. I never heard of that one before, but I dig the idea of a magic mirror. Uh, I think magic mirrors are always a good way to go, to be quite mm. frank with you. Ma- I, think Ma- of, I, I think of like uh, the Ahsoka series. Mm-hmm. Um, the not that's not what what do they call it, Stuart? It's not the mirror. The dimension. world, the world, um, the world beyond the world. worlds, or some shit like that. Not, something like that. Dang, I I totally forgot. <laughs> um, but they kind of it's kind of like the concept of like mirrors or being able to like something magical that you can step through or whatever the case may be. I'm I'm down with that blossom. Why not? Uh, let's see here. Do you think um from Johnny still? Do you think the actors who portray Robbie? And Cobra Kai could star in the new PR reboot as Tommy. I hate this dude. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's funny. I feel like you are the only uh, Power Rangers fan that doesn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, are, this goes who back to maybe Marcelino's question about like, well, he didn't, he said a character that you love that others hate. This is another character that I hate that people clearly love. Who do you hate? Um, the guy I mean, that plays Robbie and um, what is it? Um, the guy's son, uh, uh, Johnny Cobra Kai. Son Johnny's Cobra Kai. Son and Cobra Kai. No, nah, get uh, that out of here, bro. Get that out of here. They no. want him to play uh, the the new Tommy in the PR reboot. No, nah, the 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 only the it it shouldn't be Tommy. It should be like Tamitha or something. I don't know how you get a girl's name out of Tommy. <laughs> it it if Tommy's she, kind of a gender neutral name, I it, think. It, yeah. yeah, if she can act, it should be his daughter. Repri- reprising that role we know we know she has the fighting capability to do it but if she can act i don't know i know she can hey, rap. Who, are you, who are you talking about you talking about uh jenna talking- jenna jenna frank yeah man no they well they're going with the male tommy i hate to break it to you they're going with the male tommy well I then think. no no not that dude anybody but that dude like nah yeah, anybody but that dude i i just couldn't <laughs> i just I'm just not a fan. I'm just, look. I'm just not sold on his acting. I'm, I'm just not like I need to. Frankie, thank you, Fra- Frankie, so much Fra- for the uh, five dollars. Also coming through the party, Fra- man. Help us out. Frankie wants a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> he, did, he didn't even put a comment. I mean, look, but I will say, Frankie has been coming through with some super chats. Like maybe not e- not even comments attached, but I feel like the last like two three weeks, I've seen Frankie dropping some five dollars super chats here and there. So I appreciate you, Frankie. We appreciate you, Frankie. I'm I'm in front of these hot lights, bro. So I really appreciate you doing that, man. You were the best i um i gotta say uh, yeah i you know I, it's just i need to see robbie in more things you know i know a lot of people he's super talented when it comes to <laughs> for instance yep um <laughs> he's super he's super talented when he you know when it comes to martial arts and stuff but it's just his acting that i i'm just not completely sold on as of yet but I, i've said this to Stuart before like i just I just feel like he's just going to land this role, and I don't know why. Like, I feel like he's going to be what we get. It, but it, it's because it's, it's you got the uh, sh- uh, someone who works on Cobra Kai is working on the reboot, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. And then it's the fact that they keep putting him in white in Cobra Kai. <laughs> like, he's, <laughs> he's, he's always wearing white or green. It's like they're foreshadowing, like, this is the person that I want to play this role. So they keep, <laughs> so they do color association to make us picture him as that role. And his hair is just long. Like, I'm like, come on, bro. They got Jonathan, they... Jonathan and Whistle, don't do it. Don't ruin this for me. <laughs> nah, don't, don't. I'd rather it be somebody who can actually act that. Uh, yeah, and he he was the worst actor to me in that show. To be honest with you, I think so too. Like, um, was, there's other people I would much rather see, like in Cobra Kai in general. Like, I think he's he's the worst actor out of all all of them. Uh, Marcelino, she did before her father's passing. I don't know how she feels about it now. But I'm just saying, if she had the opportunity to be a part of something, to it doesn't even have to be Tommy to be a part of the of that lore. I think as something to him, it should be that. But we'll wait for Legend of the White Dragon to come out to see how she actually does as far as the actress. Can I ask you a serious question, though, Indy? Yeah, and this is is a pretty serious question. Um, Jenna Frank, have you seen the video of her recently uh, about her dropping the N word a couple times? Yeah. How do you feel about it? Uh, I'm I'm one who that should shouldn't be done, but it's not something that you know what I'm saying has ever bothered me. Uh, is it based off of like just the the culture she surrounds herself with, like the people I, she hangs out with? If if her boyfriend and stuff like that are socially susceptible with her doing that, then I can't be I can't get on her for what they accept. 
if if they let if they let her you know what i'm saying comfortable with that do that i'm something where i i'm leaning away from even using the word anymore in music and stuff like that or like in my everyday talk i've i've leaned like the past year and a half i haven't used the word i even stopped promoting my music in in it that you know what i'm saying had the word and stuff like that involved and it's not something i do but I, I, they grew up in a different culture. That's out there in the West Coast. You know what I'm saying? She'd yeah. be out in Compton and everything else like that. I don't know how they're acceptive. That's a totally different world <laughs> when you go over to the West Coast. Yeah. You sure. know what I'm saying? So I don't know. But my, my, my note, my, how I say it is if Eminem doesn't do it, you shouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> because, because you're, um, Amen. you're, you're in a different light when you're famous. And I think that changes how you, how you can act. You know what I'm saying on because it's global impact. Um, what you do with your friends and your everyday is nothing, but you got to remember that people are also uh, always going to have a camera on you and it's going to reflect. You know what I'm saying who and how you are, and that comes from her other sister, her older sister too, her other her older uh, half sister, um, who uses the word every other friggin' you know what I'm saying since since you know what I'm saying she gets, but uh, she is she is of mixed. You know what I'm saying? Origin rather than you know what I'm saying what Jenna is. So yeah, I get you. I get you. Um, yeah, I, just, I was just kind of curious about your thoughts on that. Um, so Rob, when is the Legend of the White Dragon coming out? There's no concrete release date we have on it, do we? It was supposed to come out this year, right? For his birthday, but you said it's, it's been next, pushed back. It's it's next year. Um uh what's his name? Uh Adam Alex Aaron. Aaron. Aaron has said that it will be uh next year. It's because they got the funding and the extra money to be able to work on the effects and make them better. And I think I think it's kind of hard because they want this to be a statement of J JDF's life because he put so much work into it that they that I think it's one of the things where they're going to end up trying to make the movie too perfect and end up overdoing it. God, I hope not. I hope not. Um, all right. Uh, Johnny, uh, last question from Johnny. Do you think after Sonic 3, we'll, we'll see a shadow spinoff series and maybe a tail spinoff series? um to what uh to what do you think um so yeah so we do have ourselves a knuckles limited series they haven't confirmed whether or not this is going to be like get a season two at any point in time uh it is just a six episode limited series that i would assume would then lead into sonic 3 um so after that we get our sonic trilogy any chances of other spinoffs i would almost say just give me a sonic television series at that point and have everybody involved that that's that that seems where it ends up going just have a sonic cbc started or 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 do what my daughter wants she wants an amy tv series <laughs> oh man are we gonna get introduced to her in the next sonic movie i hope not <laughs> i hope not um i would love i know it's not gonna happen i would love to see a really bad shadow the hedgehog spinoff movie where it's very mm. much just a remake of the uh, shadow the hedgehog video game from 2005 that's one of those like edgelord games that are just so dumb i kind of enjoy it just for what it is uh, as like a product of its time so much so that i want to see a remake of it but like in movie form it won't happen but that would make my day <laughs> Um, you know, if, if Sonic 3 continues to be successful at the box office, you know, I, I think it would be hard for Paramount to not want to do a fourth iteration of that franchise. So maybe it could be up in the air as to do they continue along with movies or do you then go to like a ongoing streaming stop, service? Stop, stop at three. Stop at three. Stop at three. Uh -huh. Don't go. Uh -huh. Don't go no further than that. I mean, you're on, you're on the third movie. You're already introducing Shadow. Just leave it alone. <laughs> Um, we also got uh Peg C in the house. What's up, Peg C? Appreciate you coming through. He says, Do you think episode five of X-Men 97, the tone of the episode surpassed the original animated series? I I, I don't know because that the Jean Grey death was really big. Um the Professor, the Professor X death to end the series, like mm -hmm. like to be the last <laughs> that that was like what the you know what I'm saying? That was a WTF moment to where you're like, okay, what happens next episode? And then you know what I'm saying that's the end of the series. So I don't I don't think so. I I think that for true fans, there there there's a a loyal gambit basis. People love them some Remy LeBeau. I mean, he's the one X Man that I always drop in lyrics. You know what I'm saying? Just because there's power base and stuff like that. But um, no, nah, I, I don't I don't I don't think I don't think that's the biggest WTF moment that happened. I really think the death of Professor X was was bigger than that. But the the way the episode trended leading out of him letting rogue do what she needed to do 
like professing it, like professing, like really, really professing his love, like saying, you go do what's better for you. I understand uh, not being the toxic boyfriend and then turning around and sacrificing his life for her, even though she was upset that her other love died. That's where the impact hit. Because it, it wasn't just about being a, or doing the right thing for the X Man. Because I don't believe he did a right thing being an X Man. I really feel he did that out of love for Rogue that he had. That that was a selfish thing that he did so that she could live her life. With, with you know what I'm saying type deal. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see the next episode. I think the next episode is where you're really going to have the impact hit when you see how the X Men react over what just happened because Scott's already on the line. And I really, I really think we're getting like Civil War Scott Summers. You know what I'm saying? So like that, that's what I'm excited for. So I think that's where we're going to see the impact is in the aftermath, not in it actually happening. The aftermath is going to be hard to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, but man, because like it ended on such a dark note, and now we have to see the characters mourning, like all the loss that happened. I hope they don't rush through the morning. I think if anything, one one of the gripes that I do have with this series, and I think you kind of echoed this a little bit, Indy, is they do rush through storylines a lot, or it seems like it's a very fast pace. I think episode five for me was like the first time that an episode really just kind of sat in the storytelling, really allow characters to have some great dialogue and expand on certain things and really make you feel sort of in the moment um, that they really wanted you to feel the impact of it. And I feel like episode five is the first episode that did not feel rushed to me at all. Like I felt like it was dense. Like we got a lot out of this particular episode and I'm hoping that that's the trajectory that the rest of the season goes. to allow us to sit with some of these individuals a little bit more, especially after the ramifications of what happened in episode five, instead of feeling, and like, okay, we're on to our next adventure sort of thing. I really want to see how these characters handle the situation. Well, if I'm thinking, and this is what I'm feeling after like rewatching the episodes and then like rewatching my reviews, um, I don't think I would change anything in my reviews, but I'm starting to feel like this is more of a Magneto story than like a than like an X-Men story because I really feel like it's uh, Magneto being softened and, and coming to realize what, what Charles really meant in his standing on how he wanted the world to be and actually seeing how the selflessness and whether it's going to be humans or mutants that they have. And with Scott uh, being torn between two women, losing his son, you know what I'm saying? This happening to mutants, him losing Gambit, you know, th this is going to be real, really, really hard on him and just seeing how they handle that, man, this th it's actually I feel episode to episode storytelling. It's just that I really wanted to sit with characters more. I wanted to sit with Storm more. I wanted to sit with Scott more. I, di I didn't want just two minute gaps and seeing how he's reacting to stuff. I want a whole episode reflecting how he's dealing with losing his son, how he's dealing with the two genes. And now the fact that Matt, they probably lost Madeline Pryor as well. You know what I'm saying? That that bro, not, not just that, like, yes, we lost Gambit, but dude, Madeline Pryor, all these other mutants that Magneto might be dead, like it, it's getting serious. And, yeah, it's serious. and they're going all out with this and uh cable coming back trying to stop the whole situation. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I can't wait to see where this goes. Yeah, the I will say the Scott, Madeline, and Gene got super serious this week. I was like, oh shit. Like I, I definitely did not expect that to happen at all. Like, damn, it's like yeah. I got busted. Yeah, um, I kind of I kind of yelled out world star. Like it just came <laughs> out like world star. I was like, oh my God. I did not expect that at all. But uh, yeah, I agree. I hope I hope that characters get to sit on this a little bit. Um he says, what are your thoughts on the TMNT last Ronin getting a live action? Uh, we kind of talked about that already. Um, are you excited for Mufasa, the Lion King? I, I missed the presentation at CinemaCon, so I don't know what new things they revealed for that. Um, I don't know if you guys know anything about it, but is there any level of excitement that you guys have for it? Nope, because in the end, he's going to end up falling off a cliff and dying. So. <laughs> you know how his story ends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's not no. coming back for a sequel. All right. Um, Sam, what's up, Sam? Uh, if and this is our last question, if you can get a common writer adaption in the U.S., which season are you picking? Ooh. Um, common writer build zero one, Saber or Geats? Saber for me, Saber would be cool. Uh, 
I would give it between these four. I would definitely do zero one. Uh, I honestly wouldn't even change any of the story. I would just, you know, uh, essentially just make it a dubbed version of that story. Uh, but the other one though would be common it's not on here but also common writer x8 i would love to see an adaptation of that uh especially it'd be easier to do too because then when you have the actors like suit up you could just like it's a video game themed uh common writer so you could just have it be like oh we're in the virtual world that's why the background is completely different um yeah my if i had to pick one my my first two for some reason i i definitely highlight saber and zero one for sure um but for me it'd probably be zero one i, I think i answered this last week yes oh okay. sorry that's okay oh all right I <laughs> no i thought i thought i was muted my bad sorry paces made the playoffs like, <laughs> you're good <laughs> uh yeah give me uh give me zero one um i i agree i think um that's a great story i love the i love the suit i love the henshin sequences also in that damn thing um yeah give me zero one all day that'd probably be my choice um all right guys i think um sam says yeah it feels like a dragon knight sequel oh yeah if they did saber saber yeah absolutely yeah. um but um yeah guys that will do it for all of our live viewer questions today guys so thank you everybody that certainly participated in uh sending in your questions again we usually post those every saturday saturday morning or evening for you guys so uh feel free to go ahead and uh, drop those off anytime after that but that will do it for us here today man i think i got a birthday party to go to uh today uh so we'll see how that goes um, we also have just for those big wrestling fans out there, uh, Josh, uh, Porosky, our, uh, co-host, uh, on WrestleManiacs podcast, um, beginning tomorrow, uh, I believe for raw NXT and SmackDown, he will be doing live reviews for you guys after each, uh, episode airs. Um, so certainly look forward to seeing more of Josh around here to, to helm the WrestleManiacs podcast stuff. Um, Dottila will certainly still be sprinkling in from time to time to either do reviews with us or at least discussion videos and definitely as always predictions uh and reviews for our pay-per-views uh, maybe we can get indian here somewhere involved in some of the wrestlemaniacs podcast stuff also um but i'm um, definitely look to see more wrestling around here aw um <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe you could do an AEW if you wanted to do a review for. It. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if maybe I don't know if Josh watches AEW. Maybe he does. Maybe you guys can do some AEW stuff, or if you want to helm an AEW review, um, and then I could just be there nodding my head, pretending like I know what's going on. <laughs> um, also, look forward this week to Stewart's Fallout season one review for you guys. That'll be dropping later this week. Um, I have um Boon Boomger episode six review for you guys later this week. Also, um, I maybe I'll check out another movie as well. Um, give you another movie review this week. Also, of course, we'll keep you guys updated on any huge news or trailer announcements that we want to go ahead and review and talk about with you guys this week. Uh, and then of course, X Men ninety seven coming to you from indie later this week as well. So a lot of content each and every week, guys. So if you aren't subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. If you like long form reviews, if you like the way we think, if you like hearing our thoughts on these topics, this is definitely the place for you, man. So hit that subscribe button share these videos like these videos clip these videos share them with your friends let everybody certainly know uh, about a plus hero report uh Stuart, if people want to find you on social media man where can they find you you guys can find me on instagram at turbos one and then of course you guys can always find me here at a plus hero report and yes hopefully tuesday is my goal to have the uh, fallout tv show review uh up on this channel and uh indy if people want to find you on social media where can they reach out First and foremost, right here at A Plus Hero Report, but you can also check me out on Instagram at Nerd Mix Music and stream right there. It says right there, Indie Uchiha. It goes that way. Indie Uchiha on all streaming platforms, all DSPs. Let's get them numbers up, man. Help us to help, help me, help us help you. Yeah, we're currently at um, just we're almost at 1400 subscribers. We're at like 1399. Um, so look, I, I personally have a personal goal of like 3000 subscribers by the end of the year. It'd be great if we can get to 5k. Um, but I would love to get to 3000 by the end of the year, guys. So uh, again, if you haven't subscribed, smash that subscribe button. Let everybody else know you can follow us at 
A plus opinions on social media. We're certainly everywhere. If you ever need to contact us, we do have all our contact information in the description box below. Uh, but we pretty much can find us anywhere on social media. We're also on TikTok at Hero Report. Uh, if you like uh, forum communities, we do have a Discord page as well. There is a link in the description box below. Uh, we're on wherever you listen to your audio podcast, Spotify, Apple Music, um, we're, our Apple Podcasts. We're certainly everywhere there as well. Uh, so certainly follow us, y'all. But um, until next time, we'll certainly see you guys next sa- uh, next Sunday. Uh, but in the meantime, do us a big favor as always, y'all. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And keep it A+. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>